Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of this session of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, may I remind all present to turn their electronic devices to silent or switch them off if they're liable to interfere with the sound system. And uh, also may I welcome our witnesses whom we'll introduce in a minute. The first decision is a decision to take items three and four in on the agenda in private, are we all agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. So I'll now come to our witnesses. The committee is considering the climate change plan and energy strategy, sorry. The witnesses with us today are Professor Sean Smith, who is Director of the Institute for Sustainable Construction and Professor of Construction Innovation at Edinburgh Napier University. So. Good morning and welcome, Professor. Um, our next witness moving from my left to right is Elizabeth Layton, who is Policy Advisor for the Existing Homes Alliance Scotland, and a good morning and welcome to you as well. Next is Elaine Watterson, Strategy Manager of the Energy Saving Trust. Good morning. And finally, Andrew Mowat, who is the Principal Officer regarding carbon management for Glasgow City Council. Now, I would ask the witnesses to keep their answers succinct and the committee members will no doubt seek to do the same. Uh, you don't need to answer every question and if you want to come in on a particular issue, then please simply indicate by raising your hand. No need to do anything with the buttons in front of you. The sound desk will take care of that. So I would uh, like to start with a fairly general question. I know some of you have submitted written evidence to the committee, but perhaps each of you could take a moment just to outline very briefly what you consider to be uh, key points, uh, positive or of concern in the climate change plan and the energy strategy. And perhaps I'll start with Andrew Mowat and move across from right to left on this occasion. Thank you, Chair. Um, in general terms, I think the, both documents are, are, are very good, um, pretty all-encompassing, give a good background, and then go on to, to lay out exactly how the uh, Scottish Government intends to deliver upon these points. My one point of concern is um, how heavily reliant it seems to be on carbon capture and storage. Um, Whilst I, I do believe it is a, a technology that should be considered, um, that there, there's a whole half page dedicated to it, and, and I, would, I would urge uh, ministers to, to maybe consider that uh, and how it affects the overall sort of ongoing ambitions and targets. Thank you. Elaine Watterson? Um, I think we were really pleased to see the, the ambition of the, um, of the target reductions for the residential sector. So the, 76% reduction, that's really, that's really positive. Um, and also very pleased to see that, you know, the vision around um, having 80% of households connected to um, low carbon heating by 2032. I think, I think our concern is around um, whether or not more should be done in terms of doing the energy efficiency stuff more quickly, and also possibly around that 80% target, while it's, while it's a great vision to have, the detail on, on how we get there obviously isn't there yet, and to some extent that's understandable, but it'd be, it would be good to, to have a, a little bit more detail about what that means in practice. Thank you. Elizabeth Leighton. Okay, thank you. And, and just to say, um, for those who may not be aware, the Existing Homes Alliance is a, is a coalition of bodies um, representing housing, anti-poverty and environmental sectors. Uh, uh, likewise, I, I um, support what EST's comment about the ambitious vision um, for the housing and residential sector of homes being highly efficient and uh, most of them being heated by low carbon heat. We think that that is the right vision. That's where we need to be in terms of climate change, but also in t importantly in terms of fuel poverty, because after all, the most important thing we can do for those who are fuel poor is to reduce their need to heat at all. You know, so that that's that's the best way to make sure we're putting you know money in their pockets as opposed to paying for high cost of heat. 
Um, but very concerned, and I think we've outlined this in our briefing, um, that there is quite a significant credibility gap. Um, we think it's right to have that ambition, but it shouldn't just be wishful thinking. It needs to be backed up by credible policies and resources that give us a confidence that that, is, that target will be met. And not only us the confidence, but gives the marketplace a confidence, gives householders a confidence that that is, that is definitely the direction we're going. And so we, we think we need to focus on filling that credibility gap with new um, policies and proposals and, and firm interim targets in the, rev in the final climate change plan. Thank you. Professor Smith. Um, generally, we're very supportive of their targeting measures, particularly for fuel poor, as been mentioned by others, uh, and people in low-income key groups. Um, the previous efforts around about renewables and other reduction measures in industries, such as uh, the closure of coal-fired power stations, has all helped reduce the carbon emissions. Um, in terms of the aspect of forestry, which we may not go into today, but just to touch on, um, we're very supportive of accelerating more homegrown timber into our uh, construction products and timber products for housing. We have enough timber to build 3 million homes um, from our Scottish forest, and it supports 16,000 jobs. So the efforts there to plant more trees and various other things and support the timber development program, which the Government and Forestry Commission and industry undertake, is uh, really very supportive of that direction. In terms of uh, transport, which interlinks, I think it'd be useful to come back to that as a holistic approach, maybe later on in the discussions today, and the influence around building standards and Section 7 sustainability, because the plans of food for electric vehicles we're supportive of, I think it's how we then incorporate that into some of the legislation or regulations going forward, so it links together. Thank you very much. I'll open up to general questions from other committee members. Um, Gillian Martin. Um, Andrew Merritt picked on something that jumped out at me as well. Um, I, I come from the area very nearby where Peterhead had the carbon capture and uh, storage pilot program that the funding was taken away from. Um, how do you see the, the research in that getting to a point where that's achievable given that that funding was taken away from that project? by the UK government? Um, I, I must admit, I don't know. I, I, don't, know. I, I don't know that it's, given the, the resource we have in Scotland uh, for renewable energy, I'm not convinced it's something we even really need to consider. Um, and the fact that, that there's been so much funding available, given that, uh, granted there was taken away, given that there is, has been over the last 10 years even so much funding available for the technology, I would suggest that it, it, it would have progressed now had there been a viable um, option for it, um, unlike renewables, which has increased exponentially over the same period. Um, specifically on Peterhead, I, I don't know the detail, I'm afraid. Do you, um, are you concerned that carbon capture is not going to be the answer to, re to, to reducing their carbon emissions and that we should just scrap it all together and look for alternative means, or are you...? Um, essentially, yeah, I, I think it's almost um, an excuse um, to continue to burn fossil fuels when, particularly in this country, I don't believe that's necessary. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Bowman. <coughs> Could I ask Elizabeth Layton, who I think spoke about getting marketplace and householders' confidence, could you just tell me a little bit more about what you meant by that? Sure. Um, yes, as I said, the, the ambition that is set out in, in the plan provides a signal to, to industry that you know, government is serious about this direct, the low carbon pathway for housing, and that it makes sense to invest in capacity and skills in manufacturing of low carbon technologies for homes. But if the, the policies and programs aren't there to back that up, and so that both the, mar the homeowners believe that that's a direction of travel through either um, support for regulation, but also signals through nudges, like incentives um, that can be provided, tax incentives, um, they understand that's a direction, then the, there isn't a belief that people will take up these measures, because after all, it's not all going to be dealt with through a, um, grants and programs to fuel poor. We have to talk about the whole marketplace 
of owner-occupiers as well, which is why I was, I was going to just highlight this. This is a graph that appears in, in the climate change plan of, of the trajectory that's planned. And, you know, this is the concern that we're talking about is, is what happens, you know, suddenly there's expected there's going to be this huge drop, which will be, you know, dealing with a low-carbon heat. But we feel there's much, much more that can be done during this, this period now where we there are the, um, the measures are available in terms of loft insulation. There's 600,000 lofts yet to be done, 600,000 cavity walls yet to be done, lots, thousands, hundreds of thousands of solid wall insulation. And these are all measures that would make a huge difference for the fuel poor, as well as helping address emissions reductions and setting us up for when those low carbon technologies come into play. Because after all, things like heat pumps work most effectively if the fabric of the house has been insulated as well. So we think there are several you know, steps. We think you know, almost uh, you could address about 30% of our housing stock could be brought on to low carbon heat during these, these first few years of, of the program. We don't need to wait. Could you, could, sorry, could you give us the reference or page of the oh, chart sorry. that you held up, just for the record and for future um, reference? That's figure seven. So, um, Sorry, I don't have the page number. It's figure seven from the plan. Section 8.2. Thank 40, you. Page 48. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, to say, so we need to take people with us, not just tell them what to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, certainly, yes. Gil yeah, Patterson. Some, something, I think we know that um, in relative terms that uh, local authorities and housing associations, that they're pretty proactive and, you know, we're, we're doing reasonably well in that sector. But when it comes to the private sector, this is both in terms of uh, housing and uh, industrial, commercial, etc. When it comes to individuals privately spending their money, uh, then there's a, there is a reluctance. There is, there's a, I, I need to follow that through. The business that I own, I've got a number of uh, uh, buildings, some of them are very old, very, very difficult, but the new, the, the, the new one, it was in my control, so everything was done. So regulation kind of takes care of that. How do we make the step change from what happens in the public sector, where, where we're doing reasonably well, but when it comes to the private sector, we failed? Does that, maybe I should pose a question, does it take regulation to do that, uh, or does it do we just leave it the way it is? Well, I think I, um, I welcome the question because that is something in the in the climate change plan, which is a good thing. There, there is um, a, note, a mention that they are going to consult on regulation for the private rented sector on minimum standards of energy performance, and that consultation is expected in I think this later um, next month. And I think regulation is necessary to, you know work on the, the bottom of the, of the heap, in a sense, the worst performing proper properties, which are really sort of flatlining along. They're, they're not picking up. And this will give the, you know, sort of the push to get those properties up to a minimum standard of energy performance, while at the same time you're using incentives, advice, support to pull others along to go higher up the, the energy performance certificate scale. We, th we also recognize in the plan that there's an acknowledgement um, that they will look at, the government is going to look at a phased approach to regulation for the rest of the private sector. And we think that there should be um, regulation of the owner-occupied sector as well. After all, if you're only dealing with the rented sector, that'll be about a third of the properties, which leaves us with the bulk of the properties not really addressed. And so we, we would urge that that is brought forward very quickly, and so we have a level playing field across the private housing stock. We can see how regulation has worked so well in the social housing sector. So private tenants and owners should benefit from the same good energy performance that gives us all the, the benefits of health and um, well-being, as well as saving us money. Professor Smith. Yeah, I'd very much support that, and I think the, as you mentioned, what's happened with the public sector and how they've rallied to, to meet some of the challenges to retrofit and other things has been very positive. The private sector, um, one would say maybe is, we've tackled this a bit late, 
maybe we should have done this a few years ago. Um, England is considering the same. Um, roughly, on new build, for example, whilst we have legislation for that, they represent 10 to 15 percent of all home transactions in Scotland. So let's say there's 200,000 properties which are sold across the piece in Scotland in any one year, new build and existing. So with that in mind, you have the ability, perhaps, if we give the industry enough time, because we need to skill up for this, given the scale, if people know if they had to sell a house in a particular few years' time and it had to be at band C, then they've got time for the industry and the private rented sector, or if you're letting a private rented sector, you've got time to gear up for that. So there's one thing bringing out legislation, which helps drive it um, as a stick, but you've got to give people enough time to be ready for that and have the solutions available or the SMEs ready to react to that. Elaine Watterson. Just to add to that, I mean, just to emphasise the fact that, you know, there are various ways of kind of softening the blow of regulation around providing zero interest loans for people and also for the fuel poor, obviously providing grants so that, that they have the ability to bring their homes up to any regulated standard. And also, I think it's really important to remember that for householders, regulation is already in place for things like boilers. When someone replaces their boiler, they do need to install a boiler of a certain energy efficient standard. So they're regulation already exists. It's not something completely new for the household sector. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, yeah, some of the previous questions have kind of sparked uh, questions in my mind, and especially following on from Julian Martin and this whole carbon capture and storage. I mean, I don't know if anyone else is going to, wanting to comment on that. I mean, I, I've always been puzzled by this, because if we're producing something bad, and then we just kind of stick it in the ground or keep it somewhere, that strikes me as not sustainable. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, there is a suggestion that carbon can be reused for in the chemical industry or something like that. I mean, can any of you comment or guide me, because I'm not an expert in this field, you know, is carbon capture and storage as good as using hydro or is it, are we not comparing like with like? <laughs> um, it, it's not like for like for, when you compare it against uh, any renewable source, I would argue. Um, and when you're talking about capturing from a manufacturing process and reusing that carbon, that, that's very different from um, considering carbon capture and storage, which is, as, as you allude to there, is, is almost an indefinite storage of the, the emissions in, in an underground uh, well or, 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 or a facility of some description. Um, I, I just feel that the amount of en energy and, and money and resource that would go into establishing uh, the industry um, could be better spent elsewhere um, that, that in an area that's already delivering results. I mean, we're, we're generating 57% of, of electricity from renewables already. Um, and it almost feels like we haven't really tried that hard. Um, and so I, I, just, I just feel it's a distraction. Okay, I, I'm, I'm guided that actually we're getting more about this next week. We may have a witness that's a kind of expert on this, so I'll, I'll not ask any more questions on that. Hey, yes. I've got something else, or do you want me to... No, 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 no. Put me on the list. Right. <laughs> okay. um, right, we'll just carry on. The, the private sector was mentioned, which I think is interesting, this retrofitting and all the rest of it. And immediately I'm thinking, well, what, where's the cost coming from that? I mean, is it is it, can we do that kind of thing by regulation? Can we just tell owner-occupiers that they have to retrofit their houses, as we can tell the builders, presumably, that they have to build decent houses to start with? Um, or... Is, that, is it inevitable that there's got to be a pretty hefty grants scheme tied in with any retrofitting for, for own occupiers? Elizabeth um, Yes, on, on regulation, I, I think it can be introduced in a way that it, you would never have to, you should never really have to enforce it. It should be easy for people to comply. The standard should be set at a, at a level that is relatively, you know, quite affordable, it's easy to do, it's basically just setting a standard that people have to put in place those very common sense measures like wa hot water tank jackets, loft insulation, um, draft proofing, you know, quite basic measures that really are just common sense and it's reasonable to expect that that would be a minimum standard. And, and it could be done at the change of lease, so it's easier for a landlord to do it when there might be a, you know, a vacancy there. And also you could do it, as, as Sean was suggesting, at a, when the property turns over, so at point of sale. So if the owner 
didn't want, if the seller rather, didn't want to incur that cost themselves, they could actually defer that or, or um, transfer that obligation to the buyer. And in that case, it could be picked up through the sale of the house property. So and flat, the owner, before the new owner moved in, they would have to upgrade or something like or that? Or you might have a period of time, you know, you might have a certain number of months by which they would have to upgrade the flat and present their energy performance certificate saying, I have met that standard. So there are ways to do it to make it easy for people and, and for them to recognize, see what benefits they're achieving, and it's not a huge financial burden. But at the same time, I, I agree with what Elaine was saying, that it does need to be supported by extensive advice and support from the Home Energy Scotland network. Loans, there are already zero interest loans available, and grants who aren't able to pay, because we must make sure that any regulation doesn't disadvantage those who are f fuel poor, but on the contrary, that they are benefiting from regulation. Well, it's been going so far because there's been various schemes to replace boilers and improve insulation and some of these kind of things. Have they been, is it just more of that we need to do? I think it is, we do need to up, up our level of ambition. Um, as I as said with the, the graph I was showing that's showing us and, and the tables in the climate change plan suggests that the numbers of measures that would be installed through right the way through to 2032 stay static at you know, 90,000. And the SPICE report that just came out on the climate change plan notes that in 2014-15, the number of measures that were being installed was 87,000. So that seems to me a bit business as usual rather than a national infrastructure priority on energy efficiency, which is transformational and moving us towards a housing stock that is truly low carbon. So yes, we need to up the amount of um, measures that are going into homes, and that will have to be done through a whole package of measures that will include regulation, but not wholly rely on regulation. It will have to rely on people doing voluntarily uptaking um, measures as well. I mean, that kind of ties into my final question, if I may, convener, um, which is, you know, how does, the, how does this new uh, climate change plan relate to the previous RPP? one and two that we've had. I mean, do you see them as continuations or are they a change of direction or just a kind of change of speed? Um, convener, if I may, I've, I've brought a graph. It's not digital, but um, I brought some copies which might explain that if that's of any help. Um, certainly, if you want like to provide these to us and perhaps if it could be emailed in to the, the clerks after the session so that we have a digital copy. So yes, how, how do the documents relate to each other? Well, whilst other sectors in transport and various other things by the means of how we move or our energy supplies changes, the residential sector is uh, generally fairly static in the sense of that it doesn't change. We already have most of the existing properties here and what will happen over the next uh, coming years will probably add 15 to 20% of the stock by 2050. Um, if you can see the graph in uh, front of you, um, what we've done is we've brought together the RPP1, RPP2, and I don't think we're allowed to call it RPP3 now, although we will do for the purpose of this, if I may, but the draft uh, climate change plan. Um, let me just take you through the graph. The blue dotted line at the top represents the business as usual as forecast in RPP1. So the graph you're seeing here is residential. It's the reductions or planned reductions in million tons of CO2 emissions. So the blue dashed line is business as usual, as forecast back in about 2008 with RPP1. The light blue line represents uh, what RPP1 forecast and planned from the policies that they laid out of the direction of travel. And as you can see, it reduces from about seven uh, in 2010 to about five in 2021, 2022. The orange line is the planned forecast of policies and outcomes and reduction emissions for RPP2. The black line is the most latest document, which is the expected and planned reductions using the policies. So let me just explain. So that difference in 2017 suggests that the current plan of policies on carbon reduction for residential is significantly higher than what was previously planned in the sense of there will be more leakage of carbon emissions because it's above the orange and red line. 
We then continue on. What it line, isn't uh, it? It is. As if we'd done nothing? As if we'd done nothing. It then s slopes down quite steeply and then plateaus. And then the key issue is then what happens after 2025. Because if, and this is where I will defend Scottish government, because there's lots of, no matter the political party, there are lots of issues that are happening from UK which affect the decisions of what we do up here and also what we can enforce as policies, whether it be feed-in tariffs, the uh, e ecosystems, and various other things that are going on, any energy company obligations. But if we don't hit these uh, preset targets in RPP1 or RPP2, what happens is as we get to this document, um, equivalent to the RPP3, you then squeeze into those last seven years between 2025 and 2032, the key push to get to that target you need by 2032. Now, to give you an idea of just the scale of what's going to be required, uh, and this is where I'll, I'll touch base with the existing Homes Alliance and the work that they have produced, um, we still have another 900,000 homes to retrofit. That's quite a significant task. Um, there's been some great work already. I've seen it in my local village. I've seen the changes to people's lives. They've talked about how warm their homes are now and the difference. Not all, but the majority talk about it and, and the benefits they see. With the remaining time that we have, if we targeted a band C for energy performance for these homes, the 900,000, and if we really went for 2025 rather than 2032, because I think it's quite difficult to go to the public and say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait 15 years till 2032 till we retrofit your house or we have that measure in place. So whether it's through grant availability, whether it's through legislation, whether it's a carrot where we reduce the land and transactions buildings tax for those that go to a band C, if we go for 900,000 homes by 2025, we need to retrofit one home every minute with the available time that we have till 2025. So probably in the course of this meeting this morning, the first hour, we should have retrofitted 60 homes if we have to get on target. I hope that explains where we see the RPP ones to RPP. Yeah. <clears throat> Andy Whiteman. Thank you, convener. Get my head around those figures <laughs> in due course. Um, a couple of questions. Um, one, the plan policy outcome one in the residential sector seeks improvements to the fabric of Scotland's domestic buildings, resulting in a 6% reduction in their heat demand by 2032. Um, we've been advised that that 6% reduction is not from a baseline of today or 1990 or whenever, but in fact is a reduction on the projected heat demand in 2032. I'm just wondering whether you have any um, ideas of whether there is an accept what should be the accepted baseline for measuring reduction in heat demand? Who would like to respond to that? I'm, I'm not sure if I'd respond directly to the question, but I, I do know that and our analysis of the UK Committee on Climate Change's pathway to 2032 suggests a 8% um, reduction on heat demand. So, so we're thinking it's um, not, not as strong as, as that, but I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I think there will be people on the next panel who might be able to answer that. Uh, part of that demand will be no doubt influenced by occupants' behaviour. And the data we have from a number of studies across Scotland where people have had access to real-time displays so I think we also can just differentiate between what's a smart meter that sits under your stair or a cupboard and actually someone visually seeing on the display. So most of the smart meters coming out just now will come with an in-home display so they, they can see and identify how much energy they're using and on the demand side around their home. Um, we did a study whereby where we used real-time displays with good color graphics in explaining to people easily how they're using electricity and gas and water. Um, we found that there was a 7% reduction in the use of electricity, but this was clearly seen. We had also exactly the same sizes of homes, uh, same income groups and other houses that didn't have the display, so we had the direct comparator. And where they had gas, they could use coming to the heat side, um, they reduced their gas consumption by 20%. Now, over a period of time, we've gone back to these properties over the last three years, 
and people are looking less at their in-home display because they've already started to change their behaviour. They know what parts of radiators, other aspects, and their thermometers, the things they want to change in the house. So as a result, there is the behavioural change. There is a slip back occasionally, but they do find that where it says um, you have gone over or that's flashing in a certain amount or there's a certain red light coming on um, that's telling them they're using much more, they find that extremely useful because then they can re-benchmark and reset. So it's 6% by fabric, which is a different aspect in terms of the insulation, probably I would say 8 to 9% is more likely. But the, the, the question is, what, what, what is the baseline for that 6% reduction? Good point. They don't state what their baseline is. Okay, so we need to do some work on that. Yes. There's a number of questions we have about statistics and other things in here, which we'd like to raise some queries on and raise to the committee's attention. Uh, and you will be raising them? We will do. We'll probably mention a couple today, but we will write in as well. That would be very helpful. Um, my second point is really in relationship to Elizabeth Layton's reference to, to, to wishful thinking. Um, I mean, I think all witnesses have said that the the, the targets, the ambition is, is good, um, but uh, the existing Homes Alliance, I think you refer to the fact that um, uh, uh, it lacks, um, the, 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 these targets are not backed up by what you call credible policies or proposals. Could you say a little bit more about that? What would credible policies or proposals look like? Would they, for example, be very specific numbers, very specific actions, very specific timetables, and very specific uh, costs. Um, okay, in our uh, briefing that we put out, and we will also submit more detailed evidence um, in, the, in the call for written evidence, we suggested uh, improvements that could be made to the plan that we think would help fill that credibility gap. Um, in terms of energy efficiency, we think there does need to be an interim um, milestone to indicate the trajectory, the increase in the pace and scale of improving the fabric of our homes up to an energy performance scale um, certificate, band C by 2025. So this would be doing your lofts, cavities, walls, all that. And this is very similar to the trajectory in the UK CCC pathway. So we're fair, pretty much in agreement there, and it's similar to the um, number of measures that the Scottish Government is proposing over the whole period of 2032 to 2032. So the analysis is you know, very similar, but it's the time scale that's quite different. So that's number one, quicken the pace um, and um, doing the fabric measures. In terms of low carbon heat, don't wait till 2025. We have very just a slight increase between um, now and 2020, up by a few percentage points. We think much more could be done, as I mentioned earlier, up to about, you know, at least 30% I've been able to sketch out could be done by addressing the off-gas grid pro properties, getting them all onto heat pumps, or if those that are on electric heat already, either heat pumps or much more efficient electric heating. And then there's all the uh, um, gas, uh, sorry, district heating urban networks that are waiting to be developed. These are things that are on the shelf or should be on the shelf, ready to go, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be taken forward from now through to that 25, 2025 period. So we could already, as I say, be at about 30% that are on low carbon heat by then, much quicker than what's suggested in this plan. So those are two items in terms of time scale and, and targets, so you could have interim targets on both fabric and low carbon heat. And how do you do it? Well, we need to move much faster on regulation. We've already discussed the benefits of bringing in regulation and the incentives that would go alongside that. That's being consulted on now, but there could be much firmer proposals brought forward in those consultations in terms of time scales and how quickly they could be brought in. Um, and there would also be, I have to mention the budget, I know that's something that is, you know, will be under consideration going through the Parliament, and the budget is basically standstill, and the programme for government suggests that the, and, and in this plan suggests the budget will stay the same over the next four years. 
And I think you need an increase in resources that would be consistent with having a national infrastructure priority. It's supposed to be a transformational, a, a different kind of way of doing energy efficiency. But the numbers in front of you and the trajectory suggests it's doing much the same. So resources, targets, policies should be represented in the final plan. Uh, Professor Smith. We also raised this in RPP2 because if anyone's looked at RPP2, there was the, the wonder graph with the um, additional technical advantages, etc., measures, uh, but it wasn't explained. Uh, and not only ourselves, but others did. Um, whilst we supported the targets, um, we did challenge the lack of information that was there in RPP2. So in the final version of RPP2 in section 5.4.21, uh, they stated it, the intent to produce a detailed proposal and how they may realize this potential on these higher technologies happening further up the, the, the chain, as it were, further in the timescale, in the RPP3 document. But in this document, it is not there. And now, coming to the question raised about what sort of information, I think it's the proportionality, so how it might be district, community, low carbon heat, how might be suit through other measures, just as a proportion of how they're going to arrive at this, rather than just this. I mean, this will require a seismic shift after 2025, not only for this country, for many, many other countries in, in, who are in the same boat with existing housing stock. There's a series of technologies that will need to be developed and tested and tried. Interestingly, um, when it comes to the retrofit of community heating or other district heating, um, it is not as straightforward, sadly. Um, there are all sorts of issues with cartilage, access, um, various other issues to do with the costs and delays. However, on some of the new build developments, or where there are plans for new housing, uh, there is the potential with, um, and I think some of the plans that are being put forward by the proposed city and regional deal, for example, for Edinburgh and South East Scotland, have plans to embed and look at the use of and widening of community and district heating with the new housing linking to other hubs, other infrastructure surrounding schools, leisure centres, etc. Um, the perfect example of sort of community district heating being put in is the Commonwealth Games Athletes Village. Uh, we were involved with part of that with the Commonwealth Legacy Team. It was a tremendous achievement. The excess heat is helping to support the uh, cycle track, uh, which needs 26 degrees constant temperatures. So there was an outflow for that excess heat. But the actual special pipe work that was required in some of these projects, we had to import from Russia. So if we're going to, a, with, through insulated pipe works, so if we're going to go down this particular stretch, then we need to work with the enterprise bodies, innovation hubs, innovation support centers to make sure we have the products and supports and manufacturing, because it would be a very successful way to tackle low carbon heat, but we don't want to be importing all the solutions. Thank you. Um, Ash, uh, sorry, Andy Whiteman, a brief follow-up and then come to Ash Denham. Well, it's just a, I want a slightly different question about local government. I'm just wondering uh, to what extent do you feel local government uh, is, uh, you know, part owns this plan? I mean, it's going to have a lot of responsibilities in terms of delivery. Do you think it's got the uh, resources and the, the powers to, to do so? I think resources are always going to be uh, something we could use more of. Um, I'm perhaps going to bounce that back to you, if I may, and, and um, suggest that the Scottish Government could do slightly more in the politest possible way to help facilitate some of the, the requirements that this plan will, will have. Um, and if we go to the Athletes' Village as an example, the way um, district heat and pipe work is treated in terms of the non-domestic rates is, is one such example um, of the Scottish Government dealing with a another Scottish Government department. Um, and and, and the, the, the price that... that um, the, the rates are applied at for district heating is, is the same as those applied at for the gas network. And, and clearly, they're very, two very different things. And that, that in itself, a very, very small thing, can make the difference between a, a viable project in terms of the business case and, and, and an unviable project. So, yes, the, I think that the local authority has a huge role to play in terms of facilitating for example, district heating networks, and, and I believe we, we are making some strides in that, but we do need national support in that, that front as well. Okay. Thank you, Ash. Um, I think Professor Smith made the point about 
you know, the importance of the retrofitting the existing homes really well in one of your earlier answers. And you mentioned, you know, a possible um, incentive of maybe reducing LBTT for people who got their energy performance certificate up to a certain level, maybe a C. But um, am I right in thinking that there are problems with the EPC? Um, I've heard of homes that are eco-homes, they don't have central heating, they have high levels of insulation, and they're heated by wood, and yet when you feed that into the computer program, somehow it doesn't accept the parameters because it doesn't understand, it doesn't fit in with the way the computer system's set up, and so the EPC rating that's coming out is not a high rating. Um, do you think that's a widespread problem? Uh, yes, I had it with my own home. <laughs> When the surveyor came round, poor thing, I don't think he knew what he was in for. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a, a discussion because we'd added a, a front porch, as an example. Our ancestors didn't get it wrong when they put front porches into houses because the air changes by just opening your front door and having to reheat is significant. Um, interesting to see now quite a few of the house builders are now looking to bring back porches onto new build, which is, which is really good to see. But it didn't count towards anything. Um, so we had secondary front door, we'd even replaced the front door to be a really top-end thermally insulating front door. It didn't make a difference to the EPC. We put in solar or PV, they said it's not going to make a difference, uh, we're looking at the fabric. So I was kind of thinking, I mean maybe it's, up, it's been changed since then, but it was um, pretty depressing having spent the money, done the measures, um, we're more comfortable for it, but it didn't reflect in the EPC rating. So I think the EPC actually needs a full overhaul, if I could be so blunt. Uh, and the sooner that happens, the better, but that, I think, is a, a UK-wide issue, but it, it's something which really needs to happen, so we can take account of some of the, the newer developments that have happened. Have you got any ideas about how many properties are potentially miscategorised, you know, in that way? I think because the EPC current categorisation is written in stone by the software or what the information that's input, they wouldn't be regarded as being miscategorised. I think it's a difference of opinion, coming to the point you raise about, look, someone's done all this, there's an eco-house, they're not burning gas, they're doing something else, but it's not being reflected. So it would be interesting that if we were to take, let's say, a sample, and then actually ask through that sample, if we were to change the metrics to take account of these, how many homes might then change? I think that would be useful to see and, and to do. I think Andrew Mowat wanted to come in this, and then Elizabeth Leighton. Just one point on, on EPCs. Um, I think part of the issue there is that um, the, the actual performance of a building versus the design performance um, don't often correlate particularly well. But equally, the, the results um, after an EPC is done are not necessarily fed back into the program. So we're not getting that continual evolution of the program um, and, and, and re the resultant improvements. I was just going to say, on, with regard to EPCs, to you know, differentiate between what, what's good about EPCs and you know, what are the problems, and what's good about them is that people do understand and relate to that scale, like you know, because they've had it for years with appliances, mm. now with cars, with homes, and so I think that's that's something good that we should stick with. But I agree, there are improvements that need to be made to the assessment uh, methodology, and as Sean said that is being done through the UK process. I think they've just closed a, a consultation on this latest round of improvements. And so there may be you know, ways, and I, the Scottish government's very aware of this, about how they might have to have some kind of um, parallel, you know, looking at how the EPC rating, and then perhaps something that takes into account the low carbon heat, because that's not very well represented. Whereas the EPC is much more focused on energy efficiency, which is fine as long as that's recognized. Um, so, so let's not throw EPCs out, let's fix the underpinning methodology and maintain a way of communicating with most people about, you know, just how good is my home, A to G. And to the policy outcomes too, so that's the, the really ambitious target of by 2032, 80% of domestic buildings would have their heat supplied by low carbon technologies. Um, so I've just um, used the example. So in my patch, which is in Edinburgh, there's a, a housing, a big housing development planned. I think it's something like 700 homes. It's a mixture of houses. There's apartments. There's going to be obviously a quarter of it will be affordable homes, possibly then managed by um, you know the housing association. So I know that housing associations and local authorities can apply to this um, district heating's loan fund, which sounds like a really interesting idea. 
But I suppose my question is, if we want to get 80% of um, uh, homes heated by low carbon technologies, I suppose this feeds into what you're saying, that maybe we need to start doing more now rather than waiting longer. So I suppose in a mixed tenure situation like that, but it would seem to me that district heating for the entire development would make sense, and yet only a couple of hundred homes in maybe one building could apply for the district heating loan fund. Do you think that, I mean, do you think they should, we should be looking at maybe making new builds all have district heating? I mean, what do you think about that? Do you want to go first? Yeah. I think it only works once you've got a particular size of development. I think the economies of scale then are not so good. Um, recently, we've heard um, from one major house builder that SEPA have stepped in and raised an objection to their development, despite them doing good fabric, they're planning to do for the development, solar, etc. And that's a sector that's been really badly hit by all the change in fits, mm -hmm. and that's a big SME sector. And again, I know it's outside the control of Scottish government, but Jing's, I mean, for the small SMEs who have been trying to train apprenticeships to install the micro MCS accreditation, that's been really hard for them to take all these changes and fluctuations. Um, but this particular house builder raised the issue that SEPA have actually written to them to say, we're going to write to object to your development because it's not putting in enough low carbon, uh, it's not low carbon ambition enough. Um, the builder's a bit taken aback by that. They've come to ask for advice uh, to ourselves and primarily because they're saying, if we had, they're saying if we had known, if we knew the trajectory, we would have pre-planned. So I think coming back to if we move it a district or community heating route, particularly a new build, um, then as long as we give enough time and warning that these are the intentions, um, then I think we'll have industry and, and the public on side. Um, it does bring us to one other point, if I may. In here it does say that, um, sorry, before I get there, there's an article in, sorry, page 61, they talk about district heating and the take-up of loans. And they do mention that the take-up of loans was lower than expected. I think it'd be very useful for everyone to know what was the, why did people not take up those district heating loans? Um, there will be some evidence somewhere or some uh, information. I'm sure that would be really useful because this is a learning lesson for going forward. If we want to do more district community heating, we will need to know why the people didn't take up the loans when they were available. Um, but in terms of new build, um, they mention here they want, they're maybe in 2017 going to review the energy performance of new homes. Um, our strong recommendation is not to change the new build regulations for new housing. They're still bedding in the previous regulations from 2015. They're still bedding in silver, the level of sustainability for energy performance. Give the industry time. It is more bang for the buck to go after the retrofit and support that sector than change the new build. If you were going to change new build, link transport policy with new build, with sustainability, and encourage the new build homes to incorporate ULEV connecting points for electric vehicles. They're about £390 per home with a grant, and that would start the transformational shift if people know they're buying a home, but it's already there, and they're employers with large car parks or public bodies with electrical charging points, then the home community, speaking to the business community of work or public sector work, and you're, you've got an A to B transport and charging point. Final point was um, about heating interventions made. So the idea that you've upgraded somebody's gas boiler, obviously that makes it much more efficient. But I suppose my question would be, what's the lifetime of these interventions? And will these things need to be replaced again with, with another technology in the future? Well, I can um, pick up on also on the previous question as well. In, in terms of the, the replacement cycle, that is something that should be considered as people are putting in new efficient gas boilers, have a lifetime of about 15 years. So if they're putting them in now, then you know, they'd be, we'd be in a good place to look at what is the low carbon alternative by the time that change is over. But that should also apply equally to support for extending the gas network. Should we really be doing that instead of putting people onto a low carbon alternative of, of a heat pump? Or if you can have very efficient electric heating, so looking for alternatives and rather defol and defaulting to what is already set out in this plan as, as what will be an outdated technology. Um, on district heating, I think there is, there is a, um, a consultation on heat mapping, 
for local requiring local authorities to do heat maps and also for looking at regulation of district heating that would put in place some of the drivers that we were talking about that would require a connection if it was appropriate. And, and that would support the taking forward of, of district heating. And that's something ver we very much support and would like to see more prominence given to that in the climate change plan. And lastly, on the new build regs, there is a proposal for looking at, in a sense, almost a Sullivan three um, of looking at building regulations for new build going forward, but it also has a remit for looking at existing homes. And I would argue that setting a trajectory for a new build, perhaps not, you know, there may be time to prepare, but, but putting in place that trajectory going forward is important. It's an important signal for the new build industry and it, it provides for innovation for the existing home stock, but also for existing homes, there's uh, routes to look at bringing in standards at point of major refurbishment, because after all, that is the most sensible time for you to undertake energy efficiency measures on the rest of your home when you're already having works done. And so that could be done through a building regulation process. Okay. Thank you. Richard Leonard. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm reminded in all this of the um, words of the pioneering uh, socialist and ecologist William Morris, who said, hard it is for the old world to see the new. The world as it is, is that 80% of household gas heating is supplied by, is, it comes from gas. Uh, the world as it is, is that we're in the midst of a program of uh, smart gas metering being installed. We're living in a world where gas replacement boilers are being installed up and down the country every day of the week. So I'm kind of struggling a little bit to understand how we'll get from the position uh, to date of about 80% of heating supplies in households coming from gas to a position in just 15 years time where 80% of heating supply to households will come from low carbon technologies. I wonder whether somebody could help me understand the transition from the old world to the new. Um, I th I, I, I'm not sure that anyone actually understands that and I think that's part of the problem. It's really unclear what that mix will look like out to 2032. Will the majority of people be on air source heat pumps? How many people will be connected to district heating? What proportion of households will still be heated by gas but with hydrogen injected? And it's not clear, but you're absolutely right. We're arguably, you know, we're looking at two point something million households having to have heating systems retrofitted. And if that is expected to happen in that really short time period between 2025 and 2032, what about someone that in 2025 has just installed a new gas boiler? That's going to have a lifetime of 12, 15 years. So that's beyond the 2032 time period. Are we going to be asking people to essentially replace a system that they have paid for before the end of its, its life? And I think, there's, I think there's lots of uncertainty there, and I'm not sure that anyone knows the, <laughs> knows the answer. Presumably the author of the target knows the answer. Well, even the author of the target suggests that that is more work that needs to be more work that needs to be done in order to define um, I think uh, Elizabeth Layton and then Professor Smith well I, I think the Times model knows the answer so it's it's the modeling that is is d driving that forward as being cost effective but I, I think I, I agree it is it's difficult to get your head around it but I suppose, you know, maybe you go back 20 years and, um, you know, 20, 30 years when there was more the, the dash for gas. Um, you know, so the transition can happen given, you know, the right drivers are put in place. And if it's seen as in the public interest, has that support, can happen. But what I go back to what I was saying earlier, what we do, we should focus on what we do know we can do now. And that is dealing with the off gas, dealing with the electric, getting the district heating systems in, we can do that now. And by my estimates, that gets us, and Scottish government estimates, that gets us to about 30%. We know, you know, it's not 80%, but we know we can do that. And, you know, let's, let's focus on making sure that happens in the next, you know, five to 10 years, as well as doing all this fabric improvements. I would agree with that. I think particularly in some of the rural areas, um, this is where the opportunity should be taken. Uh, in small villages, for towns and cities, um, that this change is uh, stratospheric. Um, 
Very, very difficult. The other issue is the incentive. If your current gas expenditure is a third of your electricity cost, in terms of what you're paying, if gas is a third of electricity, then you might ask the question, why would I shift? Why do I want to shift to something which may be electric-based if it's three times the price? Now, prices change. Um, there may be other incentives or other taxes. Who knows? But, um, yeah, very, very difficult. And let's not forget the pressures on the grid coming up in the next few years, um, electrification of cars, uh, further electrification of the railway lines, various other measures. So um, the resources are, are, are not easy to uh, fulfil that, that demand and need that will come. In an earlier answer, uh, Professor Smith, you referred to the, uh, the importation of pipes from Russia to, um, uh, uh, to um, fix up district heating projects. Um, uh, and I think then you made a wider point about the supply chain. And I wonder whether you could perhaps develop that uh, to, um, because we are the Economy Jobs and Fair Work Committee, I wonder whether you could say something about the potential for job generation uh, for the growth of uh, the supply industries uh, to some of these new low carbon technologies. I mean, certainly on the, on the job side, if I can start off with the more negative side of things of what's coming in the next few years, because we have a really tough task for construction just now in the sector, and this, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. But giving you some Scottish figures, um, in, by 2021, 19,000 people will have left the jobs market of the construction sector in Scotland through retirement, various other means. We need to replace an annual recruitment requirement in Scotland of 4,000 people per year. The growth of South East Scotland and Edinburgh will require an additional 1,200 people to be trained per year for the next five years to meet the growth trajectories of the 28% growth in population that's happening in South East Scotland, particularly around Edinburgh. When you consider Brexit, 12% um, of the UK's construction workforce are EU workers. Um, Scotland's about 9.6%, roughly about 1 in 10. But in London, 35 to 50% of EU workers are based on the uh, house building sites. Now we saw what happened in the 80s, we saw what happened in the 90s, that when London booms or they need the skills, there's a sort of migration internally in the UK of the workforce south to London. So um, taking everything else we have to do, the task alone of just getting enough skilled people to come in will be significant. And uh, I think construction really needs further support from the government. I know they have put in for more modern apprenticeships and things, but as a sector, to build the hospitals, the care homes, the flats, the residential, the retrofit, it's a sector crying out for a lot more help to achieve this. In terms of jobs, for every new build home that we build, the jobs are 4.3 jobs for every home that gets built. Interestingly, the figures they show here are for every 100 million pounds of investment in retrofit, it's uh, 1,000 jobs. Um, I think the figure is higher than that. I think they've done themselves down a bit in here in the statistics. They say Scottish government analysis, but they don't reference the report. So I'd really like to see that because our feeling is it's much higher than a thousand jobs for a hundred million investment. Um, but going forward, yes, significant jobs. If you consider what we were talking about before for retrofit, if we do go after one home every minute for retrofit, that's a considerable amount of activity. Thank you. Um, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks, convener. Most of the questions I was going to ask uh, have been covered by other members, but one thing I was going to ask about was the service sector. And um, I'm noting that um, the service sector carbon envelope is expected to reduce by 96% over the next 16 years, the second most ambitious reduction after the electricity se sector. And I'm just wondering how realistic that number was. Realistic. <laughs> um, it's the, certainly on the non-domestic sector, and commercial and other things, the, the, the biggest gap we have now actually if we go forward with the carbon reductions, energy efficiency plans across all the building stock, the big gap just now is in the commercial and uh, public sector areas. Um, there's some great projects going out on just now in Scotland to determine you know, more accurate, better solutions. Um, City of Edinburgh Council is doing one just now where they're mapping all of their current building stock uh, that they have non-residential to look at all the various solutions, um, but not the only ones. Um, we know other local authorities have also been looking at various aspects of their building stock, but maybe I'd uh, 
better to ask the local authority person to respond on that. But from the from the private sector, there's a there's a huge amount of work required because at least with housing, you've got a standardised approach. We have 240,000 uh, 170,000 four in a block. We have 240,000 tenements in Scotland. So we have a fantastic standardised approach that we could take. As soon as you go non-residential, as soon as you go into the commercial or public buildings, the stock variation, the building variation, is quite bespoke across the country. So therefore, the remedial treatments, fabric, or other energy solutions required to reduce your carbon footprint become more complex. And is there any easy intervention that could be put in place in order to push that, everybody towards that target? I don't have a full answer for that. No. I'll pass to, to other colleagues on that. Well, well, I might be straying outside my existing homes brief, but there, at, in the Climate Change Act of 2009, they, um, there was an enabling powers to introduce regulation of the non-domestic sec buildings sector. And those were just introduced last year. And uh, while that's it's good that they're there, but they're, I would say they're quite weak, very light touch, and it's basically just requiring some assessment to be done, but not really much of a requirement to actually act on those, that action plan. And so I would hope that this climate change plan could require a review of, of what's been put in place and that that is strengthened as soon as possible because for the non-domestic sector, it must be relatively easy to regulate. It may be a bit of a challenge to sometimes find the solutions, but I would think in many cases, um, some proper regulation brought in place would rather quickly bring up the standards. Thank you, and, and Dean Lockhart. We've spoken quite a lot about policy and, and regulation, which has been very helpful, and uh, you've covered a lot of the, the other questions I had. Can I turn now to technology and the role of technology in this area and get your thoughts on um, the use of new technologies in energy efficiency and decarbonisation and how the energy strategy can best incorporate uh, the use of new technologies. Professor Smith, you spoke, spoke about s smart meters and h how they've resulted in a reduction in uh, energy uh, usage at, at key points. I understand there might be a possibility going forward you can actually monitor your energy consumption through your mo mobile phone, which I think would be a, a, a real step forward. What other changes might be coming down the, 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 the pipeline in terms of new technologies? Because policy will obviously have to keep pace with new technologies. Can I just add to um, what Sean was saying about smart meters? One thing that we are working on at the moment and really keen to do more of is to look at how we can link the advice that's provided through the Home Energy Scotland to people's smart meter data so we can provide much more personalised and specific um, advice to people based on their actual energy use and their actual energy use patterns so we can spot what's happening and talk to people much more about what behaviours they might be using in the home and, and how they can control their heating better, etc. Um, yes, on the, on the point about technologies, um, my answer is going to be more about the use of technologies, like with smart meters, because after all, that's when we'll really gain the, realize the potential of how they can help us reduce energy. And I think much more needs to be provided, and I'd like to see it um, spelled out in the climate change plan in more detail is support in terms of how people use energy in their homes. Because some of these technologies that come in, you know, like using a smartphone to remotely manage your heating, you know, fantastic. But there are a lot of people that just ha don't have a clue of how to do that, let alone how to use their heating controls in their home. And some of the pilot studies for the new energy efficiency program are looking at how to, what kinds of support work best at first identifying what the needs are in terms of their energy use, what are the solutions, and then sort of aftercare program of making sure they know how to use the radiator controls. They know how to, you know, they know about curtains, they know about, you know, just the basics. And it's, it's proving to make quite a significant difference. And it's really value for money because they're not just getting the kit put in, but we're actually you know, seeing that performance gap address between what's predicted we're going to save to what actually happens and the person's experience. 
and some of the new technologies. We've been through various phases recently um, where industry, um, government, um, construction product suppliers have looked at different products. Uh, one of us in relation to uh, a new type of thermal board, for example, um, which had, I think, some people had great plans that for the older stock, uh, particularly pre-1919, these thin type of boards would have been uh, super efficient in terms of their performance. Um, both ourselves, Historic Scotland and others have, have looked at these boards um, and, and there are issues, particularly in the cost, um, but other issues in relation to um, their creep over time. Um, that said, there's other things happening just now in terms of the internet of things, which has been touched on there. Um, and there's some Scottish companies developing new softwares. We have tended to find that people are not too keen actually on the control side from, from their phones or whatever else. They're actually just more interested in the data and the information so they can see what's going on. Um, so to that end, there's a number of companies in Scotland developing softwares which will help people understand how they're utilizing things within their own homes or their car. And almost you, be, you become almost the, the energy person, whatever you're driving, doing, etc. living is, is going to be part of, of what's in this uh, piece of software. Developments in some of the electrical uh, sectors such as OLED TVs, we remember seeing these about eight, nine years ago. Great to see them coming out, reducing uh, the amount of energy that's going to be required. But it's also a learning curve because we've seen with the push some years ago on passive homes and passive direction, um, although it's a bit of a, a strange name because it's not passive, we use mechanical ventilated systems. Um, I remember walking into a demonstrator house with a lot of government MSPs and uh, civil servants and other people from different parties a few years ago. Uh, into a, a passive or near passive uh, house and uh, most people were pretty frightened by it. They didn't like the, the feel of it, uh, the air didn't move. They were... That said, you can still open windows, so there's a few myths. Of course you can open a window in passive. But we have to be careful because then if we drive up the temperature or energy, sorry, energy performance of that building so much and people are not ventilating and they don't understand how to live in a passive home, then you get black mole, damp, asthma and various other things. Um, but the mechanical ventilated heating that you require for uh, passive type directions of uh, energy standards, you also need to change the filters. Now most people don't change the air filters above their cooker hoods, so we're going to re require them to change the air filters for the mechanical ventilated heating system quite regularly. Um, so there is a, a paradigm shift in, for people to understand how they use that home with the new technologies. I think the, the best steps that we've seen coming are in the fabric. Uh, recently, Scottish house builders have built a series of sort of prototype and other homes which are now coming into the market. The average energy bill in Scotland is about £1,400 a year, dual fuel bill. These new homes are £300 a year or less. So the mechanisms are there through um, less sexy technologies, if we could put it that way, through the more standard approach with some of the fabric, and Scottish companies can deliver that, which is tremendous, and the architects are designing it. And the local authorities are very supportive because it's hitting the energy performance standard. It's not requiring too high tech. I was just gonna point out that perhaps we don't need to rely too much on, on new technologies. There's, there's a lot of stuff already there that we're not doing particularly well yet anyway. Um, and just on the behavioral change side of stuff, more on the non-domestic side, I must admit, but we found that any intervention that we, we implement, it's best to, to target those that don't require the input of the user. Um, that just takes the behavior change issue out of the equation altogether. And so things like building fabric improvements that don't require people to know how to do things or require maintenance or, or any of these, these kind of um, longer term thoughts um, are, are, are preferable. Uh, in, in my, my opinion. And you will always get those who, who, who pursue the technologies and, 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 and want to, to have the latest kit and gear, and that, that's fine, but building fabric stuff, uh, localized electricity, uh, energy generation in general, um, local um, district heating networks, um, these things are already there. The technology support, support these things are already there. I don't think we need to worry too much about what's over the horizon. Just on the, on the building fabric side of things, I think it's really important to note that even when you improve a home's building fabric, often people inside the home don't know, for example, how to change their heating controls as a result of living in a warmer home, and they will just, for example, do things like open the window to start to control the heating. So just to come back to the point that even if we are just focusing on building fabric improvements, 
the people in the home are a really important part of that, and them knowing how to use the heating controls is, is really important if we are to get the, the carbon savings that, that we should be getting. Just in relation to fabric, back in about 2007-8, we advised, as did others, that we should be putting 200 millimetres of insulation in lofts, because whilst we're there not putting 100, we need to put in at least 200. Sadly, we didn't do that. Um, now it's interesting that one of the policies is that by 2032, I think they want to have 200 millimetres of insulation mm -hmm. in the loft. So we're going to have to go back into a lot of these homes and put in that second layer. Uh, one point to note, um, just to the committee, on page 48, their 8.23, their first milestone, where they say by 2020, 60% of walls will be insulated. Um, According to our stats, actually, they're already at 60% just now, depending on, on, on but as far as we've done, we've gone through these. It's cavity and solid wall. Yes, so. that's right. So um, previously, the page before, they cite that they're up to 71% for cavity and 11% for solid wall. When we take the figures um, for the solid and the cavity walls, which are available, we have them at uh, roughly 60% already just now. So I think that milestone, I think they've stated elsewhere, they see it as 57% at the moment for cavity, uh, for external walls. I think it'd be nice to see that milestone lifted above 60. Um, so if you, it reflects as a real milestone. And uh, while we're speaking about milestones, Professor, 200 millimetres, is that about eight inches for those who think in old measurements in terms of? It, it is. The optimum depth is actually 270 millimetres but 200 would be better than 100 at least. Right. Thank you very much. Well, on that uh, note, we'll close this section of this morning. Uh, I'll suspend the hearing to allow us to uh, change witnesses. Thank you very much to all four of our witnesses for coming in today. And I'll also note that Jackie Bailey has intimated her apologies, the committee member um, who had expected to be here, but uh, I'll just note that at this stage. Thank you very much. We'll recommence at 10 minutes to.
Well, welcome back to everyone, and uh, may I thank our witnesses for coming along for our second panel this morning. Um, in no particular order, we have Gina Hanrahan, who is Climate and Energy Policy Officer, WWF UK, Professor Keith Bell, who is, um, I think, of Scottish Power, uh, Professor of Smart Grids is what I have here. Perhaps you can correct my misdescription if that is what it is. Um, Co-director of the UK Energy Research Centre at the University of Strathclyde, Dr. Mark Winskill, Research Fellow of the University of Edinburgh, and Gillian Herding, who is Access Project Manager of Community Energy Scotland. So welcome to all of you this morning. Um, I'll start with a general question, and that is if each of you could give, perhaps very briefly, your key points and key concerns about the climate change plan and the energy strategy. So perhaps starting from left to right, Gillian Herding. Um, I think sort of echoing the points of our, my colleagues on the panel this morning in general terms, we're obviously happy to see the continued support or the continued ambitions of the plan. Um, and in relation to the strategy, the support that's um, maintained for community energy. Um, I think obviously um, we see community energy as a fundamental sort of key driver in the transition that needs to happen in terms of changing consumer awareness, consumer behaviours um, as we move towards smart energy transitions. I suppose in terms of concerns around that, it's mainly perhaps less of a concern but more of a consideration around the role that communities are expected to to play when they're taking forward these innovative projects. So previously we've seen communities really easily able to access um, funding for renewable energy systems through the feed-in tariffs and so on. And that was a really, you know, a, a good way of communities engaging with the energy policy um, in a roundabout way. But now when we're sort of expecting more innovative solutions, innovative technologies, communities are really taking on a huge risk in the, in the delivery of these projects. Um, and I think that's not to say that there's, there's not any sort of lack of motivation or ambition or even capability there, but I think it's maybe a concern around sharing that risk. The energy strategy sort of reflects on the fact that it expects some of these projects to fail because of their innovative nature. But it would, I think it would be wise to consider the impacts of that on the local communities themselves, but what it means for taking further sort of smart energy projects forward in a similar way. Thank you. Professor Bell. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm not of Scottish Power, by the way. I, I do speak as an independent academic, although they, they do sponsor the chair, uh, just to put that on the record. Yes, thank you, you for that clarification. My, my apologies <coughs> That's if I right. got it wrong. Um, I think this is uh, warmly to be welcomed, the, the energy strategy. I think as a responsible and civilised nation, I think it's uh, absolutely right that we play our part towards the kind of global efforts uh, towards decarbonisation uh, and of course we need to ensure uh, reliability and affordability of, of energy and I think it's right that, those, that, that, that that is expressed through some targets and it's right that those targets are stretching but it's also uh, got to be realistic and ensure that they are achievable albeit uh, you know they are you know, should, be, should be ambitious to, to some extent. I think another thing that's to be applauded is the attempt to consider the whole energy system so not just electricity not just heat not just transport but the whole thing together and there's a lot of very difficult trade-offs to be tr to be evaluated in doing that I can't honestly say that this is the final answer I think um, what has been presented in the drafts both the draft climate change plan and the draft energy strategy should be seen as, as firstly as draft but it's a, a really good starting point for discussion for, <coughs> for debate and then for further analysis I know that uh, the Scottish Government have been working very hard to improve their modelling and analysis capability, and that's absolutely to be applauded again. But I think there is more to be done. You know, it's, it's a challenging thing. There are definitely uncertainties, both in terms of the modelling itself inherently, by the time you make the kinds of approximations you need to make to give some sense of whether all of this really is achievable and what seem to be the main kind of uh, pathways. Uh, but also just in the, in the kind of the, the data that goes in that, you know, what the, what the trends are likely to be in terms of relative technology costs, how, as you were talking about in the previous session, how uh, energy users are going to engage with some of the different technologies or some of the different interventions. So, um, yes, it's good that this is, uh, has, has been published. It's good that there are ambitious targets. We need to explore, I think, the achievability and a bit more detail on the, the different pathways and on the implementation further. And, of course, in that... Uh, the Scottish Government is one among a whole number of really important stakeholders 
Uh, UK government, of course, is very important. Uh, to date, the EU has been very important. We have to see how that plan pans out. And, of course, industry and individual consumers are very important in, in all of this as well. Um, WWF would strongly welcome the 50% uh, target that was set for renewable energy by 2030 in the energy strategy. I think that's a target that's both uh, credible and achievable, it's something we've been calling for, for a long time together with a, a whole range of different stakeholders and industry. So that's a very, very welcome step forward. And it gives confidence uh, about the direction of travel now. Um, on the climate change plan more broadly, I suppose um, we are overall disappointed at the level of policy detail that's included in it. It used to be called the Report on Policies and Proposals. It's got a snazzier title now, but ultimately what this is supposed to do is give a clear indication of all the policies and proposals that are going to deliver the targets that have been set out from the Times model. And we don't have confidence that there's enough in there that the carbon envelopes will be delivered. The Committee on Climate Change has repeatedly said that more policy effort needs to happen if we're going to deliver on existing targets, let alone future targets. Um, but I think there are three areas that are within the remit of this committee that it's worth focusing on um, as deficient. Uh, the first is on energy efficiency. Uh, we heard a lot this morning about how the approach is pretty much business as usual, and that's despite the very, very welcome commitment to make energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority. But if we're going to be um, strong about that and, and, and maximise the benefits of, of making that an infrastructure priority and bringing all homes up to a really good standard, we need to move much faster than the plan indicates. We need to fund it and we need to, need to make clear how we're going to deliver on it. And I don't think there's enough detail there. On heat, I think there's a very stretching policy outcome in both the uh, residential and services sectors for almost complete decarbonisation, 80% in homes and I think 94% in the non-domestic sector. Um, but there's very little detail about how that's actually going to be delivered and what it looks like in terms of technology mix. Uh, there's a proposal in there that backloads effort to the late 2020s, starting from 2025. I think there's a, an issue around credibility there um, in terms of policy. And on electricity, I think overall the plan is, uh, the energy strategy and the climate change plan are, are, are good. They're welcome steps forward. It's good to see an acknowledgement that we're going to have a near decarbonized system by 2020. Um, but I would question the reliance on CCS for negative emissions uh, from the mid-2020s. Um, and I think you know, that, that, that might come to pass, but we shouldn't build it in as our plan A. So. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, I, so I agree with most of what's been said so far. Um, I think there are some issues about uh, just at the very high level in terms of the, the way the, 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 the two documents look together. Um, and also the kind of process for consultation. Um, so we've been working, uh, Keith is a UK Energy Research Centre colleague of mine, and I also work for Climate Exchange, which is the uh, Scottish Government National Centre for Expertise on uh, Climate Change and Energy Policy. So we've been working uh, reasonably closely with the Scottish Government in, in helping sort of uh, uh, provide advice for this energy strategy and the plan. Um, I think overall, uh, you know, it's already been said by everybody that we welcome the ambition. Uh, climate science is ever more kind of confident about uh, the urgency and scale of the challenge globally and, and uh, how that cascades down to, to Europe and to, 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 to nations. So that's all welcome. Uh, we've got raised ambition in the climate change plan. Um, the overall uh, carbon envelope is raised as a, a, um, uh, related to the most recent advice from the Committee on Climate Change, so that, again, seems appropriate. Um, I, I think that, that one of the, uh, the problems we have is, is uh, the, the amount of detail that we're seeing in both documents is lacking um, in, in terms of how we can go about engaging and kind of offering advice on alternative pathways and uh, technology portfolios, levels of demand, uh, assumed demand, and so on. So, um, you know, we, we have a, uh, a, a single pathway in the climate change plan, um, which is appropriate because there has to be a single advice to government, uh, but there isn't any uh, attempt to, to look at alternative pathways and uh, to systematically go through, you know, what if CCS doesn't appear and things like that, or what if demand can be reduced more rapidly than perhaps is assumed in the single uh, climate change plan. So um, there's a problem, I think, there. But there's then uh, looking at the energy strategy, which is the, the sort of the companion piece. 
um, we, 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 again, we don't see any alternative integrated pathways which would allow us to sort of systematically interrogate the kind of assumptions about overall system cost, uh, relative, demand, uh, relative efforts on supply and demand. Uh, there was some interesting discussion just at the end of the last panel about you know, the technology is already there. We don't need to uh, think about radical technologies. We can just use the technologies that already exist. And we don't, you know, there was a suggestion that we, we can avoid a lot of uh, behavioral change if, you know, the smart thing is just to uh, avoid disruptive behavioral change. So, so all those kind of issues need really interrogating and thinking through systematically what if, you know, um, these technologies don't appear. So I, th I think that, you know, there's a bit of a problem about how we engage from now on in the consultation period. I know the Scottish Government's intention is to make this um, information available over time, but it isn't there at the moment. Right. Thank you very much. Um, we'll start with a question from Dean Lockhart. Um, sorry, can, we, can I come in a bit later? Yes, certainly. Do we have a question from Andy Whiteman? <coughs> uh, thank you, Convener. Thanks for those opening remarks. Could I just, um, there's a number of things to pick up on, but um, first of all, it's not, it's not entirely clear to me. The, the overall target is, is set, that's clear, um, but it's not entirely clear why the individual sector envelopes have been set at the level they have been. And I'm not entirely clear as to the constraints that were placed on the model to get the pathway that we've got. Um, I've asked Scottish Government about this and they um, say that they would, you know, do as much as they can to provide greater transparency, but I'm not, I'm still not clear. Are, are any of you clear why the different sectors have got the targets they've got? No. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Simple answer. I think, um, I think there's, there's two potential ways of looking at this. One is to say, well, come on, give us the detail. You've done all this modelling. You're producing a, 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 a strategy. It's you know, receiving a lot of attention, quite rightly, a lot of discussion, not just us, but lots of other people, lots of investors looking at it. Surely you can give us some more information and some more detail and more of the sensitivity analysis around it. Absolutely, I would totally agree with that. Um, on the other hand, my understanding is that they're really just kind of building up this modeling capability. Now, maybe they should have invested more time and resource into it because it does have such an influence on the way the strategy is perceived and the way in which the different sectors are going to respond to it and see it as a potential, you know, potentially the right or a good pathway to follow. So um, I think I would certainly encourage greater investment of time and effort on the part of the Sc Scottish Government and uh, advisors working with them to produce exactly that kind of analysis and the kind of the detail. Because as Mark said, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around precisely what pathways. This is only one among a number of potential pathways and the, the assumptions that have gone into that are not, are not clear. And I think, I think Gina mentioned, you know, that about sort of the, the heat decarbonisation, for example. There are things in some of the charts which are produced in the documents that do look like modelling artefacts rather than necessarily kind of um, reflections of a real world as we might expect to see it. Um, but you've got to start somewhere, I think, you know, and so there's basically more work to be done and let's, uh, let's encourage the officials and their advisors to get on with that. Could anyone else like Yeah, sorry, Gina. Uh, well, I, I do agree with that. I mean, I think uh, the Scottish Government have already said that, the, you know, and there is uh, a, 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 a process by which the modelling, modelling results have been fed back to the policy teams and then to the... Uh, Cabinet subcommittee uh, for sign off and so on. So, I think you know the modelling is is um, almost a starting point for a systematic kind of look at energy and climate policy. It's it, and it's a particular tool. So there are other ways of doing. You know the RPP2 process was very different. It was a bottom up sector by sector approach, which had a lot more detail actually in some of the policy domains than we've got in the climate strategy. So there are advantages to the way this has been done with the uh, the Times model. And I think, you know, we, 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 in the UK Energy Research, Research Centre, we've spent a lot of time using the same tools. Um, but we've learned as well that the, the, the system uh, models are kind of um, give you a, a partial insight. And there's an awful lot of off-model knowledge that has to go into any kind of properly integrated strategy. I think the, one of the issues is that uh, we, we don't have... Um, yeah, I mean, this business of, of sector envelopes. So if you look at the Committee on Climate Change's advice 
on the same pathway. So the Committee on Climate Change published some um, uh, 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 pathway uh, analysis in March last year uh, for Scotland based on the same period, 28, 28 to 2032. And if you compare the sector em em carbon em envelopes that the CCC came up with compared to the uh, CC plan, uh, they do look quite different. So, for example, there's a much less uh, emphasis on uh, building sector emissions, uh, domestic and non-domestic, non um, out to 2032 in the CCC work than you find in the CC plan. Uh, there's much more emphasis on transport sector emission reductions in the CCC work. So the CCC didn't use a system model. They did bottom-up analysis. Um, akin, I suppose, to RPP2, there was some modeling work commissioned, but uh, they didn't use the Times model. The, what the, so the CCC haven't had use of the Times model, I don't think, uh, the Scottish Times model. Um, so the, it does beg the question why, why you know, uh, this, this pattern of sectoral carbon envelopes and um, what kind of sensitivities have been looked at. You know, I, I think that that work has been done within government. Um, um, I know, you know, the government gave evidence to the uh, Environment Committee last week and they said they've looked at different scenarios. They looked at uh, what if we don't get CCS on the system. So that has been looked at, that's been costed. Um, and, you know, you can, you can imagine there's, there's uh, what, we, what we're seeing is a is a is a version of a least pa cost pathway, but I think we're we're we're, we're lacking um, enough kind of data and uh, evidence on the assumptions and things that we can really kind of help. You know, in terms of the, the consultation process from now on, I think um, given we've only got a few months to do this, uh, I think it would have been helpful to to make that a bit more systematically evident. You know, so we can really get to work on on the assumptions and the data. I think it's very helpful. I mean, I, I note, for example, the... And come in on that, I think, and then you can briefly come... Briefly add to that and, and, and echo the, the points that have been made already. Just, just to clarify, I think that two of the sectors that are going to be the biggest emitting sectors in the 2030s, so agriculture and, and transport, uh, were inputs to times rather than outputs of times. Is that correct? C close to that, anyway. Yeah, um, the assumptions were done so elsewhere. The yep. assumptions were built outside the Times model, so that's, that's important to note. I think transparency is key here, and I think we do need to understand particularly what policy political constraints were imposed on Times and how far what we see in the climate change plan is from the original run of Times. Um, so that, I think... Uh, understanding the various iterations of it is, is very important. I mean, this goes particularly hard on heat, for instance. Does that then let other sectors off the hook when there might be actually huge progress that can be made much faster, for instance, in transport? Um, it, we're, we're, we're less ambitious there than we are on heat. So I think, I think understanding times and, and why it's done what it's done is crucial. Thank you. Um, Gillian Herding, perhaps, yeah, and then... And it's a very general point, I suppose. I, I think it's just to not... With, with those considerations, and I take Keith's point about having to start somewhere, um, the, with, with the modelling and, and these sort of sectoral envelopes, I think it's important just to maintain that acknowledgement that we're going, if, you know, when we're, we're transitioning to the smart energy systems, then there'll be sharing of this generation and demand, there'll be sharing of these, out, you know, um, CO2 outputs that, that will need to be in, encompassed into whatever is taken forward. I mean, I don't know how that modelling would look um, if we're not sure how the existing modelling already exists, but I think it's, it's important to bear that in mind that, yeah, the smart energy transition will involve sectors. Uh, sort of operating in that way. Andy Whiteman, I think you wanted to come. Just two brief su supplementaries. Um, what evidence do you have, uh, Gina, that assumptions around are built outside the Times model? I mean, if they were, I I'd like to know what those assumptions were. Obviously, you may not be privy to them, but what evidence do you have that they were actually uh, built? And the second point is in relationship to your uh, WWF's recommendation that um, there shouldn't be an assumption in favour of negative emissions um, for electricity by 2032. Um, but if, if CCS is a technology that works, then presumably CCS should do as much as it can. So is underpinning that recommendation the fact that you don't think CCS should be given the status that it has in the plan, um, or, or, or what? 
Um, so to deal with the first question on agriculture and transport, I'm not privy to the uh, full workings of times, but that's my understanding based on conversations with the modelers. Um, and I'm sure the Scottish government could provide you with much more detail on that. Um, on the CCS point, um, there might be an important role for carbon capture and storage globally, particularly in the industrial sector long term. Uh, a lot of people do see it as an important part of the decarbonisation pathway. Um, we have done a number of pieces of research over the last number of years, so WWF in conjunction with um, Friends of the Earth Scotland and RSPB Scotland uh, commissioned work by uh, Ricardo Energy and Environment which looked at um, Scottish electricity system um, and indeed renewable energy more generally um, and it showed that we don't need to have CCS to decarbonise electricity in Scotland. Um, and deliver security of supply by 2030 so that we can maximise our renewable energy resources and have an effectively wholly decarbonised system without CCS. So we don't need it for electricity here, though it may have an important role uh, to play in decarbonising industry long term. I guess what we're just questioning is the credibility of relying on it um, to deliver, I think it's minus 1.1 megatons by 2032. That's a significant amount of emissions. If that doesn't come to pass, where, where do we flex in other sectors to deliver more? Um, so we just don't see it as part of plan A for this climate change plan, particularly in electricity. I wonder if I could uh, maybe add, add to that. Um, I think I would echo what Gina was saying about the risk um, associated with you know, apparently relying on a particular technology, but that isn't what a strategy should be setting out. Here's a reliance on any particular technology. It should be setting out uh, shorter term policy interventions that enable the longer term outcome even if the particular pathway by which we reach that longer term outcome is still to a large extent, extent to be determined. So that means to, uh, you know, you, you kind of go for the low regrets type of actions in the short term to keep different options open that seem to have some potential for the longer term. And that would seem to me to include CCS, uh, where, you know, the potential benefits of it, if it does come to pass in the kind of cost regions that people are talking about, would be very large, and as you say, if you've got it and it works and it's cost effective, then, then use it. Of course, we don't know what the costs are really gonna be. So it's, it's not my area, it's not something I feel confident speaking about, and I know you've got a session next week where you'll be hearing about, about that. Uh, where you'll be hearing from a geologist, for example, who can tell you a lot about the storage aspects of it, but I would encourage you to talk to a chemical engineer who can talk about the other aspects of it to get a, a, an idea as to whether the kind of cost assumptions that are typically used by energy economists are really robust. Dr. Winscombe. Yes. So I just wanted to come back on, on, uh, on Andy's uh, point about um, the, the, to what extent the, the assumptions on things like transport have been made out, out with the model and, and that is specified in the in the annex so there's a there's a times model annex at the back of the cc plan which um makes clear that the that the carbon envelope for transport was developed um through uh, some consultancy research um and through transport scotland um for the you know uh, for the residential sector they use the national housing model um it's interesting that for demand, this isn't the version of the model that's been used isn't elastic demand. So um, that means that the levels of demand have been inputted into the model rather than sort of allowed to develop within the model. So I think, you know, in, in, if we're thinking about the overall approach and whether there's enough emphasis on demand reduction, uh, it'd be interesting to know, you know, why we have the, those kind of levels of uh, assumed demand. The demand uh, le reduction levels look quite modest to me in, in so the, the heat sector. Um, so I'd, I'd like to understand those a bit more. Um, that seems to have been based on external assumptions. So I think we need, you know, that would be one of the key areas for me. I think Gina Hanrahan want to come back briefly on this and then we'll move to a question from Bill Bowman. Convener. Just briefly on the issue of negative emissions, uh, the energy strategy seems to indicate that uh, a lot of that will be delivered through bioenergy carbon capture and storage. And uh, we don't have enough detail on that. I think the strategy commits to a bioenergy action plan or strategy to come forward in the next year or so. Um, but that raises sustainability concerns around where, where that source of bioenergy is coming from. We just don't know enough at this stage to say whether that's A, credible and B, sustainable. Bill Bowman. Convener, just like to go back to something Gillian Harding said earlier. 
talking about community energy being key, and that some projects, I think you said, were being inhibited by risks that were being passed to them. Was that financial risks or other risks, and how would you suggest these are dealt with? Um, I think, yes, yeah, so my general point was around um, the sort of move to expecting, so community energy is sort of driving that innovation, it is at the forefront of that innovation, and I think it's a real achievement um, of Scottish communities, and obviously with the financial support that the um, Scottish Government has provided through various schemes that we're at that stage. I think now, and sort of given the regularity regulatory constraints or the political constraints that perhaps Westminster um, are more inclined to um, impose on these sorts of projects or the impact on these projects. Um, there's a risk from for communities if, if these projects do fail, um, what it means for them sort of as individuals, often voluntary based organisations to then take forward um, additional projects, but also what that means to um, within their local community, but what that means for other sort of similar smart grids um, smart grid projects going forward but I think in terms of risk sharing I mean it's really sort of you know these projects involve a lot of sort of very broad stakeholder um, partnerships so communities working with organizations like energy suppliers with um, DNOs or DSOs um, and that's you know conversations that they might not normally be involved with so um, and this isn't saying like just a plug but organizations like intermediaries like Community Energy Scotland working sort of to sort of navigate that path with them I think is helpful but I think sort of you know more basic things like extending delivery times for those sorts of projects um, maybe from three to five years um, and acknowledging the time skills that it takes to go from you know conceptual ideas to full-scale delivery um, and implementation would be helpful as well and I think sort of yeah help with the financial risk of those projects would be beneficial as well um, you know with the removal of the feed-in tariffs and so on it's more it's proving more difficult for communities to get financial support so loans and so on so um, it is very difficult for them to muster the capital investment um, up front uh, so you think they need more advice or they, they need some form of legal protection I think there's definitely an uh, an acknowledgement of the complexity of these projects and um, as they move to sort of more demand side management based projects you, you know there's um, communities that are working with energy suppliers to provide um, heating services for example so if you're looking at that model yes we're working within um, you know the projects that are personally managed we're working with the legalities of the energy supplier that is in the project partnership but I think yes having some sort of general advice that's consistent to these types of innovation projects would be helpful. A uh, brief follow-up from Julian Martin. Uh, Mr Bowman's question, can you be more specific about the types of projects where you have seen a risk, <coughs> a risk when taken where there has been fear? Can you give me an example of, of where that's happened and wh why that's happened? Well, you're, you're talking about communities who've invested in, in, in a project where that actually hasn't worked out for them um, as a result of maybe a change in policy or tariffs been imposed or, or any kind of subsidies been withdrawn. Can, can you give me an example of where that's happened? And yeah, no, so, sorry, I should confirm. So these risks, these projects haven't failed or there's not sort of particular projects that I'm referencing at the moment. I think just within the energy strategy, it acknowledges that some of these projects might fail. Um, and you know, and that leads to the point that they will include the, the learning from those projects as well, so we can sort of take that forward. But I think it's within that context. So if when, for example, when we put bids together for these types of projects, allowing sort of scope, so allowing um, funds to go towards the operational cost to like a very comprehensive risk assessment and that sort of thing. So I'm talking preventatively rather than based on something that's happened. Thanks. Thank you. Ash Denham. Um, certainly, as I was reading through the documents, I was really interested to see the proposal for the creation of the government-owned energy company and that it might be potentially funded by selling Scottish renewable energy bonds. I'm interested in the views of the panel on that, what sort of impact they think it might have and whether they think it is something the government should be pursuing. Um, yeah, I think... Um, sort of again sort of speaking generally I think anything that sort of extends um, the funding mechanisms that communities can um, access that um, consumers can access is helpful so I suppose um, yeah the option of a government-owned energy company offers a little bit more longevity in that sense 
Um, and yet, in terms of the renewable ones, I think that there would, you know, that would be a positive step forward. I think it allows um, individuals or communities who might not necessarily own their own properties, um, own space, to, to buy into renewable energy. And I think it is a very positive, positive option. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what the legalities are of uh, the state getting involved at whatever level, but um, the idea of a bond has, has, has some attractions, yeah. Just to add on the the proposal around um, the government kind of having uh, extensive power purchase agreements as well, I thought was um, interesting as a way of uh, alternative support for onshore wind. It's kind of raised and hinted at in the document, not fully fleshed out. Um, uh, the government already has a contract to procure 100% renewable energy, is my understanding. Um, but this would be a more direct way of supporting uh, onshore, and I think that that is also very welcome. I mean, I, I, so the strategy, the sorry, the, the climate change plan pathway depends on at least a doubling and I think a trebling on onshore wind to 2032. So how how is that going to happen? We know, we know the UK government is unlikely, the current government is unlikely to offer any more support for onshore wind. So. This is a sort of necessary consequence of that pathway, I suppose. Um, I think we're lacking details about uh, the government-owned energy company and exactly what the, the sort of you know the risks and liabilities, as well as the advantages, are of doing that. You know, it, ultimately the government then becomes the risk manager, the risk taker, rather than uh, private companies, and and so on. So the, I think that needs a, a, a closer look at. Yeah. I think um, I think that kind of unpicks one of the kind of key issues around the whole of. Uh, well, energy strategy at a UK level and a Scotland level, a European level of the last few years, about the management of, of risk and uncertainty. So up till now, certainly uh, yeah, renewable electricity seems to be the most cost-effective way of trying to kind of get some uh, decarbonisation of energy use. But the technologies have uh, had some uh, uncertainties associated with them. There have been you know, costs where they've been higher than the kind of fossil fuel-based alternatives. But largely as a result of policies that have been put in place, those costs have come down. And so I think it is realistic to talk about subsidy-free uh, onshore wind or solar PV or whatever in, the, in, you know, in the, the right kind of circumstances. And then the, the trick comes, well, all right, well, how do you still enable the investment in these kinds of uh, things to, to, to take place? UK government has not been afraid, actually, of intervening and has not, and it has therefore, in other words, not left it entirely to the market. So the capacity market that uh, you would have heard about in the news this the last couple of days in which you know, the auction is taking place and then you know, bids should be submitted in the next few days is one example. Uh, the contracts for different auctions are another example. So the central procurement of certain volumes with guaranteed prices is a way of de-risking and of facilitating the investment. So in a way that kind of um, step has already been taken which means, I think, that the kind of idea of a subsidy-free central procurement, it's all, you know, that point has already been acknowledged to, to an extent. You know? um, so it's less about what the subsidy is, in inverted commas, than about how to actually facilitate the investment. And, uh, and in a way that, and, and you know, as Mark says, you know, who's picking up risks associated with that? There are still uncertainties, as we've mentioned already, about the whole energy system and how, what's the most cost-effective way of decarbonising it and what we commit to in the short to medium term, uh, in the longer term, you know, if you're going to commit to anything like this that, and to enable the investment, a longer term contract seems to be necessary. And we hear that all the time in terms of flexible demand or about uh, electricity generation capacity or whatever it happens to be. So longer term contracts seem to be reasonable, but then there's always a the risk that you might be, have some stranded assets then or you commit yourself to a contract that with the benefit of hindsight turns out not to have been quite the cheapest way of doing it. Who bears that kind of risk? Well, arguably, that's the sort of risk that you socialise because the whole kind of decarbonisation, reliability and affordability agenda suggests that it, it should be, it should be socialised. So I think we need to get into the detail of how we do that and how you meet the costs of it. In other words, who, what, what split of the bill goes where? And that's absolutely the right thing for policymakers to talk about. And another, again, an example of that is the renewables um, financial mechanisms to date have been imposed on bill payers, so your part of the total cost is proportional to how much energy you use. And we do hear people saying, well, maybe it should be on a, on a basis of, of tax. That's a perfectly valid debate to take place, and it's the sort of thing that um, I would look to the likes of you to, get, to engage with as part of uh, you know, our political representation. Yeah, because I, I suppose it does seem to me that if you have a government-owned energy company and if it was capitalised appropriately, 
um, that it, they could take more risk perhaps in getting in earlier with technologies that maybe the market may not support. I suppose I'm thinking here about WAVE where we've obviously seen problems in, in getting that off the ground for lack of investment from the market. So it seems, although you've said we don't maybe need to pursue new technologies as such because we have technologies that, that could work, but it seems to me that there might be opportunities there if we have um, different modes of investment maybe. Different modes of investment already. So WAVE is a long way off, by the way, I think. You know, and I, just because we've got some technologies that do seem to be what we might talk about, grid parity in terms of, of overall cost, doesn't mean that there isn't a need for innovation. Uh, and clearly there are, there's enormous potential offshore for, for the harvesting of energy. Unfortunately, it's the same energy that tends to break the machinery. But, you know, so there's, there's issues there. But, it, but the kind of mechanism you put on that, because it's still quite low technology readiness level, would be a different mechanism with a different perception of risk, let's say. Um, I think, in, you know, it, the, the system as a whole still is one of those big issues that to, to be addressed, not just about what the, path, what the right pathway is, and we've talked about that already, but just if you limit it to electricity, which is, okay, is my specialism, 100% um, renewable electricity system is highly challenging. Now, if you happen to have the right kind of um, geographical resources that you can have lots of hydro in that, then yeah, it's great, fantastic, go for it. You know, you've got lots of that flexibility. One of the massive challenges is the huge disparity between the demand for heating in winter and the demand for heating in summer and the, so the total energy doesn't tell you the whole story. We have to actually look at the time dimension of it as well. And, and then the spatial dimension, because you've got to get the energy from one place to another. And therein lie, I think, the need, the, the need for, for further innovation, further research, uh, to finally get the reliability that we want at least cost while staying within a particular carbon trajectory. One final short question. Um, if we're looking ahead and we're seeing more electricity demand, so I'm thinking electrification of maybe some further rail lines, I'm thinking about people who might be placing orders for electric cars, which that could take off um, if we're switching, if we're trying to decarbonise heating for domestic and non-domestic and people are switching to electricity for that. Do you think the assumptions that have been made about the demand um, looking into the future are about right? I think the kind of whole energy system model that we've been talking about and uh, you know criticizing a little bit but you know it's a good way of informing the debate starts from energy services rather than necessarily it's a particular number of megawatt hours of electricity a particular number of megawatt hours of um, gas or hydrogen or whatever it happens to be so yes there are some uncertainties about the energy service demand and that's the point i think that mark made about the inelasticity of it these sorts of models tend to take the energy service demand as a given so Clearly, there are feedbacks that go on within society and within the economy that that isn't actually you know, completely the right answer. So there is a need for a more sophisticated modelling that kind of iterates with other sorts, of, other sorts of models. In principle, if you believe the way that times is set up, then it optimises quite how you meet that heat need, whether through electricity or through burning hydrogen or whatever it happens to be. And uh, as I said, as, I, as we said earlier, you know, that's where some of the uncertainties are, because we're not actually totally sure about some of the relative costs. We're not sure about the deliverability in terms of the, you know, the whole supply chain, for example. But at least it gives us a set of potential pathways that allow us to dig in in more detail and test the assumptions. I, you know, I see the value of something like times modelling as not being in terms of answering questions, but in helping us to know the next questions to ask. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question on demand specifically, but um, yeah, there was a, another point about sort of risk that I wanted to make, but I'll try and work in as well. Um, so on demand, um, so looking at this sector by sector, um, for electricity, um, we, we're getting pretty close to, you know, the 100% target. Um, so for uh, the, the future growth of uh, low carbon electricity is, is based on assumptions of export, predominantly to, to our UK, um, which makes a lot of sense at the our UK, you know, at, at the GB and time, UK times uh, level. That's all kind of, uh, you know, uh, consistent economic least cost approaches to, to decarbonisation. Um, uh, for the other sectors, I would say uh, this is again in the absence of a lot of evidence um, published in the in the plan. It seems to me that um, the demand reductions for residential and, and non-domestic buildings are are very modest. So, 
if I've got this right, it, it suggests um, um, a 6% reduction in um, residential heat demand by 2032 and 10% for the non-domestic sector. Now, we've already seen quite dramatic changes in uh, heat demand, residential and, and non-residential, over the last 10 years. It's partly because prices have been doubling for heat, uh, but there's also um, a, a suspicion that you know this is partly about uh, efficiency measures and, and so on. So you, you, you know, I think the prospect of going further on heat demand reduction isn't sufficiently recognised in the plan as it stands. That's important not only because um, it's the least cost way of doing the job of decarbonisation, but it also makes the business case for heat supply infrastructure investments. It changes the economics of that. So if there's less demand to service. The case for building loads of new heat infrastructure, however, whatever it is, electrical or heat networks, or even uh, gas grid repurposing, that all becomes weakened. There's less demand out there. So we need to get demand right. And I think that's where, you know, the, the whole system strategy should start with a serious look at, you know, demand uh, levels, what can be um, managed out of the system and what's realistic. We don't, without expecting this to be a silver bullet, and we've got the problem of rebound effects, but we know that uh, demand reduction is already happening in heat. It's very pretty dramatic. The, the other point I just wanted to make about risk um, is that because we've got a very ambitious overall carbon envelope here to 2032, and because the uh, carbon envelopes are concentrated on heat and electricity particularly, um, the trajectories are now significantly ahead of where the UK sees itself in the heat sector and the power sector. So we're waiting for the UK government's carbon emissions reduction plan, which is due, I understand, in March. Um, but we all, already the evidence is here that Scotland is embarking, uh, for example, on a heat transition at least five years ahead of where the UK government and uh, the latest kind of uh, discussions from uh, the department see heat, the heat sort of transition. So. The implications of that are, uh, you know, there might be some advantages in doing that, getting ahead of building your supply chain up. I'm sure that's, you know, there are advantages in, 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 a, in a transition. But, but if Scotland um, is going ahead on heat, ahead of the UK, are we able to socialise the costs of that infrastructure around the whole of the UK? Um, there's an issue there, you know. Um, it also means that the... Um, the sort of power sector trajectory is seeing the early in, uh, earlier int introduction of CCS than the UK government envisages at the moment. I don't think that's going to change. We haven't heard it much by way of uh, the UK government published an industrial strategy which uh, notably avoided saying anything about CCS. It talked about lots of other things like e-vehicles and smart power. It didn't say anything about CCS. So I don't think we're going to see a, a, a kind of uh, a turnaround um, in the near term on CCS. I think we do need to, to, to try and support CCS at the UK level. But it does mean that the Scottish trajectory on power and heat is exposed to um, you know, a, a lack of effort at the UK level. So quite how that's going to the financial implications of that, if we're just socialising around the Scottish economy rather than the UK economy, I think that, that really needs thinking through in terms of the macroeconomic kind of consequences. Okay. Uh, just to echo the points that have been made, I, I, I fully agree that the um, ambitions on demand reduction do seem modest. I was here for the previous session where one of your uh, witnesses held up that very interesting graph looking at the uh, projections from RPP 1 and 2 versus the current plan, and it, it looks uh, less ambitious, uh, followed by a very ambitious fall off from 2025, but um, uh, much less ambitious previously. Um, I think managing uh, the electrification of heat and transport requires us to really uh, think very hard about how we can <clears throat> excuse me, improve uh, the fabric of our homes as much as we can, as quickly as we can, so that we're not wasting that heat in the first place, or so that we, the demand for heat is reduced in the first place. And in that respect, we think that the plan broadly doesn't go far enough. There's still 1.5 million homes below a C standard in Scotland, so a lot more can be done and a lot faster. Um, transport we haven't talked about much, but the uh, plan is broadly reliant on uh, electrification. Um, it, it primarily focuses on technological change in the transport sector. Um, that looks like a, a clear policy decision, but 
modal shift and promoting modal shift, whether that's to active travel, whether that's to public transport, whether that's freight consolidation and other areas, that, that is a, a, a critical component of ensuring that the demand on the electricity system is manageable going forward. And just on the issue of uh, heat pumps, um, our report uh, that I mentioned earlier by Ricardo Energy and Environment uh, introduced, uh, the, the vast bulk of the heat pumps that it introduced were hybrid heat pumps, so hybrid electric and gas to reduce the peakiness on the system at certain times. Um, so th that's, a, that's a possibility, that could be a technology that uh, will form part of the mix. The CCC has s said it could be a transitional technology, but there are, there are other ways of managing this demand and getting, getting the demand down in the first place is what we need to concentrate on. Thank you. Uh, Gillian Herding wanted to come in and then a brief follow-up from Gordon MacDonald. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly add to that. I think, you know, we've, we have focused on the, the risk associated with being more innovative and so on. And I, I just think it's important to also note that the role that community energy or these types of projects actually play, in, you know, aside from the local energy economy benefits that are um, associated with them, but just in terms of communicating these really sort of quite complex technical systems and so on. Um, I think in that sense, it's a real, um, you know, it would be really vital to focus on, on the positive aspects of community energy um, as well and sort of and sort of moving towards these demand reductions that we need to see from various sectors, how those are normalised, how those are socialised through peer-to-peer -peer learning and so on, which comes about from, you know, the actual practical on-the-ground solutions that people can see in their neighbourhoods or in their local areas. And, uh, you know, previously we focused on sort of um, the highlands and islands, or a lot of these projects are within the highlands and islands or in rural communities. But as we sort of moving to sort of more local projects, so Tower Power Project in Edinburgh, for example, where we're sort of um, approaching people who wouldn't maybe traditionally be involved in these types of projects or people that we have sort of a so social obligation to reach out to, we can sort of, you know, transfer that message into much more broader um, areas of influence as well. To move, uh, to go back to the point that Mark Winskill raised about the UK government and uh, how Scotland's five years ahead and the impact that the UK government could have on the climate change plan and the targets we achieve, I'm thinking of the evidence from the existing Homes Alliance that says in order to go to a low carbon heat technology, uh, it says it relies on the UK government to make decisions on the long term future of the gas network. Um, in terms of transport, emission standards and excise duty are very much still a reserved matter for the UK government. And in industry, um, it's the UK government that's looking at climate change agreements and climate change levy. So I'm just wondering, what's the role of the UK government in, in uh, this plan? And are they acting as a break rather than supporting it moving forward, given that five-year difference? We just, again, we just don't really know how much ambition is going to be built in, into what we see in the carbon emission reduction plan. I think that's absolutely critical to the, um, to the feasibility of what we're seeing in the Scottish Climate Change Plan. Um, I, I, I mean, I probably know most about heat um, because I've been looking at that for a, for a couple of years now. And um, the heat sectors, um, I mean, I would agree um, with what was said there by the existing Home, Homes Alliance that... Uh, the heat problem has, has become the kind of focus of attention for, for the UK government as well as the Scottish government. This is not just uh, uh, a, a Scottish uh, government concern. But the evidence on heat and the, um, you know, what, what is the, 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 the most affordable decarbonisation approach for heat has really been uh, difficult to kind of... Uh, uh, pinned down. So there's been, we've moved away from thinking electrification is the way to do it uh, towards a, an interest in, in district heating. Uh, and then in the last sort of, uh, just the last sort of two years really, um, the idea of using hydrogen in the existing gas mains and the distribution network, that's really come back into policy interest. So, and I know that the Scottish Government are, are, are really looking at that as well. There's some suggestion that that's built into a modest amount that's already built into the climate change plan pathway. And then I think the government are, are looking at um, uh, a much greater take up of, of um, <coughs> hydrogen for heating in uh, the energy strategy to, out to 2050. So I think the, the problem is uh, what we have in the plan is a very, so uh, it's what Gina said that there's uh, not much happening um, in terms of uh, getting the deployment of these technologies up to about 2027, 
and then we've got seven years of very rapid change in the climate change plan. So we've got almost the wholesale transformation of the Scottish building stock uh, within a seven year period. Now that is remarkable. It's akin to, I was looking at the penetration rates when we went from um, town mains gas to, um, to, to, to natural gas for heating. And it's, it's, it's as quick or about the same speed of transformation. Uh, and that was using an existing pipeline. Uh, a, there was a backbone pipeline already in place that they built for the, for the liquid natural gas that they could convert for the, so that wasn't totally new infrastructure. So, um, and the fact that Scotland is intending to do this sort of ahead of UK government, so it's, it's doing you know, a, quite a radical transformation. Uh, it doesn't say exactly how much district heating, how much heat pump, how much hydrogen we're seeing there, but either way, you know, all three are quite, quite disruptive and quite costly. There isn't any, uh, a, an obvious winner amongst those three at the moment in the evidence, so, and to compress that all into seven years. So, the, you know, the question is, I'm not saying that's, you know, beyond belief, but uh, what happens before that? So what are we doing for the decade from now to 2027 in preparation to make that presumably the, you know, as Keith says, some of this can be associated with just the way the model optimizes, that it concentrates effort at certain times and you get these breakpoints in the trajectories, which isn't quite how things tend to happen in, 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 in sort of the real world. But uh, it means that over that, those 10 years, we've got sort of 10 years preparation time on heat. There has to be a lot of work on demonstrating these technologies at sufficient scale to make sensible kind of um, business plans for, this, for the mass rollout of these technologies. So we need a, 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 you know, a proper demonstrator on this, this idea of hydrogen. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of different people saying different things about this. I think we need a, um, understanding the appropriate role for district heating. We need, we need some proper scale uh, pilots. I know SEEP is intending to look at supply as well as demand, but I, I think uh, demand is, I think demand is more of an obvious area for, for rollout than supply at the moment, which, where the evidence is still missing. So, you know, I think there are, there are real risks here and we need a sort of, um, we need more detail about um, if the, you know, I, and I, I think some of this, once we've seen what the UK government intends to do, we can say, how exposed is Scotland really going to be in some of these areas? Um, yeah. Gil Patterson with a brief supplementary and then we'll move on to John Mason. It was something from this morning's uh, earlier on session and Gina Hanrahan, uh, Gina Hanrahan has mentioned something about it but maybe go, could maybe go a bit further. Uh, the, the question was raised and we talked extensively about uh, heat loss and retrofitting and in the private sector, public sector. And although we are doing reasonably well when it comes to the public sector, when it comes to the private sector, both at, uh, within industry, business, uh, and in a domestic situation, then it's very difficult. So my, uh, my question to you would be, well, what would you see that we should do uh, in order to encourage them is it the stick or is it the carrot or is it regulation that we need? So I, I think the answer on that is a bit of everything. So this, um, the SEEP programme, which is supposed to deliver this massive retrofit of all commercial and, um, not, and domestic uh, homes uh, over a 15 to 20 year period, uh, it, it, it should be designed to... Um, to, with a mix of measures, and that's the intention. So there'll be a, a mixture of incentives, regulation for the private rented sector, regulation long-term for the owner-occupied sector, which includes commercial buildings, um, potentially uh, a, a range of different financial incentives. We can use the capital budget. So it's a whole mix of different approaches. Um, there's a consultation out on SEEP at the moment, and uh, the SEEP programme has been in development now for about 18 months, is my understanding. The commitment to a national infrastructure priority was made in, in 2015. And what we don't have in that consultation is enough detail on the government's preferred scenario now for SEEP, um, what the balance is between those measures and how much money is going to be put up exactly when regulation is going to come in. And I think <clears throat> seeking clarity on that from the government would be very useful. Um, if the, the plans for emissions reductions in the residential and services sector are to be fully credible. Thanks for that. Thank you. 
Um, did someone else want to just make a brief point on that as well, or? One more thing to it, if I may. Um, the uh, sleep consultation sets out um, the intention to introduce regulation for the owner-occupied sector as well, long term. Um, these are proposals, the regulatory proposals were contained in previous RPPs. So we're, we haven't seen a massive development of policy uh, on the regulatory aspect. There was a commitment uh, uh, to, to do this for a long time and a working group was set up to look at regulation of the private sector as a whole uh, in the last parliament. It was known as the REAPS working group. Some of you may have been familiar with its workings and it came uh, close to producing uh, consultation for uh, regulation of all owner-occupied and private sector homes. Um, so we need to see that happen much faster, given that it's been in the pipeline for a very long time. Thank you. John Mason. Well, just following on really from that very point is, is my question is the continuity between the previous RPPs and what we're now seeing in the, in the climate change plan. I mean, there's been some suggestions that, for example, in heat, we've made progress, we're easing off, and then we're going to make more progress in the future. But as overall, I mean, how do you see the continuity of this? Is this a big change we're, we're looking at now, or is it very much continuing what we've been doing already? So they've been produced in different ways. So um, I think, you know, I was involved in uh, consultations in RPP2 in, in Parliament, and we were making the criticism then that it was very difficult to get a kind of a level of consistency across the sectors and in terms of how the information was presented and how justification for the proposals and policies was, was set out. So the idea of doing it this way with an integrated model was to make that all more consistent. And, and there is, um, yeah, just presentationally, there's a nice kind of level of consistency about the way the, the sectoral um, um, information is presented. I, I mean, I think some of the things hasn't changed. So however you do this, whether it's a bottom-up um, sector by sector approach or more of a kind of optimizing across the whole system. There are some consistent messages about, uh, you know, electricity first, um, the, um, um, the, 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 you know, the, the low hanging fruit in, in terms of uh, decarbonized uh, power and so on. And RPP2 also had ambition around CCS. I remember we made the very same criticism that you know uh, there's a there's a, a lot of expectation. I think I think RPP2 had CCS coming in in the mid 2020s to a significant level, and we know you know that's that's quite unlikely. We've got moderate amounts. I think even in the late 2020s in in, um, in the CC plan for for, for uh, CCS, um, I, I don't think the fundamentals change really however it's done and I think we, kind of, we are although we've been quite critical in many of the specifics I think we welcome uh, an attempt to to try and integrate policy across across the energy uh, space and across climate change and across land use I mean that absolutely kind of should lend greater transparency um, I think we're struggling because we haven't had the sort of the all the data and the information that's gone into the government's thinking um, I, 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 yeah, I, I think what happens with a this, with this system model, uh, you know, starting at the integrated version first is it then goes to the policy teams and it goes to uh, government, um, um, you know, the subcommittee, and they will then kind of put a kind of, um, uh, a kind of feasibility kind of imprint on it. So you end up with something rather similar. Um, and I think we don't, you're not, we're not saying the move to using... Uh, and a more integrated version from the outset is, is at all kind of unwelcome. I think that is welcome, but it, it you know, it, it has its own kind of strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think either, uh, broadly I would, you know, I just, just want some more information so we, we, we can sort of uh, see uh, what are the sort of sensitivities involved in the CC plan and, and, and so on. Yeah. I think the clear message that it seems to be emerging from, I think, all of us is, uh, is about a lack of detail. So there's a detail in terms of how did this pathway come, quite come, up, come about? You know, so I think, as I said at the beginning, it's good to have an ambitious target, but it needs to be achievable, even if achievable at a stretch. So let's see how far we're stretching ourselves in the different sectors. And I think we've all kind of touched on that in different ways. And another other aspect of the detail is about the implementation. What concrete steps can be taken, should be taken now? And some of the questions you've asked are kind of, you know, uh, addressing that, that point really, and, and you know, for example, something that Gillian has talked about in relation to community energy is, and, and about the uh, building sector and whatever, it's about the implementation. That's, that's what we haven't seen yet. 
<coughs> if what's been published so far is the starting point of uh, a further process of deliberation, analysis, uh, debate about the implementation where we do finally get some concrete steps, then it will have served a very, very useful purpose. I mean, to return to the question about the UK government, this is one of the tr tricky bits, is that that level of policy has an enormous influence on this. And it is a key part of the, the implementation of any of this. You know, there's only a certain amount that we can do. And then, okay, within Scotland, we can make certain choices which will have uh, social and economic impacts. You know, there are cost implications to a lot of these possible pathways. Many of them, over the medium to longer term, actually have an economic benefit. We haven't seen an analysis that kind of fleshes that out, but it, other studies have suggested that there is, and it feels like there should be. Then, then for, even for those, there's a question of finance. You know, how do you unlock the money? How do you unlock the investment? Who, who takes on the debt in the short term? So those are perfectly reasonable things to, to try to, to discuss. But there is the possibility that by embracing a very ambitious target, which is out of step with our immediate industrial competitors, we impose some costs on ourselves. Now, that's a choice we can take, but we should take that choice with our eyes open in relation to the potential benefits on, on health, empowerment, uh, the kind of the general environment, etc. So it's, yeah, just to cut that short, next, next step is more detail. If, if I may aid the committee's scrutiny by suggesting what kind of more detail we, we, we should see, um, in addition to all the things that Keith and Mark have, have spoken about, Things that we've lost from the previous um, RPP include clear abatement figures. So there were tables at the back of the EPIC RPP that uh, set out what each policy was doing each year in terms of emissions reduction. That was very clear. It was good in terms of uh, monitoring. You could see what was supposed to be doing what, when. So we don't know at this stage either the relative contribution of individual policies or the, exactly what's happening over the time scale. So I think clearer figures on that would be useful. Um, there were costings in the last RPP, which we don't have any more, um, of, of the, the, essentially what budget would be attributed um, and what, what individual policies would cost. Um, so I think a little bit more clarity on that would be useful. And of course, more clarity on the time's output, as we've discussed, as well as new policy. Okay, I mean, if I can have a supplementary. Um, I mean, you've mentioned about the detail and the lack of detail. And there's also been mention of, you know, in a sense, there's been a change in I don't know, it was mood or fashion or swing. That I mean, in the past, we, the assumption was, well, let's put everything onto electricity because that'll be good. And then one or two of you have said, well, that doesn't seem to be quite the, the way we're going now. And things like, I mean, it seems to me that, well, leaving aside carbon capture and storage, district heating systems seem to be kind of a bit of a flavour of the month. I mean, are we all convinced that that is definitely the way to go? Because I think we had evidence previously that, uh, you know, actually the UK individual boiler in a house system is quite efficient. Um, are there really gains to be made with district heating systems? The evidence on heat uh, is really mixed, and I've yeah, spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, what different people are saying about the relative kind of attractiveness of these different uh, options on low carbon heat. And um, yeah, uh, we're, we're sort of at a stage where um, uh, there are quite kind of um, you know, what, every option on heat has its advantages and disadvantages. District heating um, is getting a lot of interest in the Scottish government and in the Scottish sort of energy community. I think there are kind of dangers there. Um, and I think that's where we do need... Um, um, I, I, well, so... Um, uh, so some of the scenarios suggest that it's an, a, a very expensive kind of infrastructure commitment, that you start kind of putting the infrastructures in, it becomes a very expensive kind of, uh, you know, step-by-step um, -step approach to getting the infrastructure in. It, there's also kind of concerns about where is the low-carbon heat coming from. So heat networks are, a, are, a, are essentially a, a heat pipe in the ground, not connected to anything specifically. So the way they tend to be used at the moment is, is um, a gas CHP uh, combined heat and power engine. So the actual carbon savings you get from running that, um, assuming you get your um, uh, electricity decarbonisation, you know, by the time um, you get your electricity decarbonised, and electricity is pretty well decarbonised already in Scotland, um, uh, uh, a district heating running on a conventional gas engine doesn't provide any carbon savings. So, uh, yeah. Is one boiler 
it would the, strike me as a non-expert, yeah. you know, one big boiler is going to be more efficient than 20 little ones. Uh, well, it, it would if you were just starting from, let's build something from scratch. You know, we spent a long time in the UK uh, uh, getting an, a, an efficient and a national system of gas, distribution, gas uh, transmission and distribution and domestic scale boilers. So the implications of going from um, individual householder to a kind of community scale heat system is quite a disruptive change for the UK. So that needs to be factored into the pathway. So what, what a lot of the uh, groups have been doing, I think one of them is actually referenced in um, either the energy strategy, the climate change plan, some, some work carried out by KPMG looking at different uh, vectors for heat. Um, and that's, you know, that's quite cautionary on, on district heating. It, but it's one of amongst a, a number of studies of that kind. Um, you know, and, and it's not that district heating doesn't, doesn't have a role. It's likely to have a role in certain areas for certain types of housing stock and for, for new build especially. For, so, so what we need is, uh, I mean, I was at a meeting in, in London looking at heat and somebody from uh, the new department uh, Bay's uh, head, of, head of strategy there was saying, uh, the UK government doesn't have a good grasp of the evidence on heat. Didn't quite say that, but he said, we need to really get to grips with the evidence, we need to own the evidence, and we need to make some kind of sensible judgments on heat. And I, I do think that's the same problem for the, for the Scottish government. I mean, one thing I just say briefly is that at the same time as we've got the energy strategy consultation, we've got some uh, <clears throat> specific sector specific consultations. So Gina mentioned the SEAP consultation, we've got an onshore wind consultation, we've also got a, a, a local heat and energy efficiency consultation, and these are quite specific. So the local heat consultation is talking about uh, granting uh, regulatory uh, regulating heat in a new way, so uh, local authorities will have the power to create heat zones where district heating will be the preferred technology and what's called concessions will be granted, so it's kind of compulsory connect uh, within, within certain parts of, of local authority areas. Now, what I find is that there's a bit of a disconnect between what we're saying at the system level on the heat problem, where there's a lot of uncertainty and we need to spend quite a bit of time uh, on demonstration and trials and looking at the evidence systematically, and then what's happening at the regulatory level and at the local authority level, where there's quite a lot of ambition already going ahead in terms of uh, will we'll designate areas for preferred uh, technologies. So I, and I don't see those joined up very well. And we're not really, uh, you know, we've got, so I think, you know, I'd like to hear from the government exactly how they're joining those two things up, what they think at the system level and what they're doing in terms of map planning at the, at, at, at the local authority level. Richard Leonard in at this stage. Um, we've heard um, quite a bit about the uh, decarbonisation of electricity use and uh, that we are almost 100% uh, reliant on renewables, uh, but that overlooks the nuclear question, doesn't it, um, as things currently stand? And uh, I just wonder whether you'd like to reflect on uh, where that is uh, and where you think that might go in the future. Um, what is also something which was alluded to by Dr. Winskill, I think, uh, in the passing was the fact that we are part of a GB um, electricity grid and energy market. So um, do you have a view on the extent to which we can um, uh, credibly measure uh, CO2 from the Scottish system if we're part of a bigger grid uh, which might contain CO2 elsewhere in it? Uh, first thing, I think, I think Mark was quite careful in his use of words there about low carbon, which would include uh, nuclear. Uh, we depend absolutely on being part of a bigger system to be able to say that uh, the amount of uh, electrical energy we, we generate in Scotland in a course of a year equals or exceeds the total amount of electrical energy that we consume in Scotland in the course of a year because there are times when we have a surplus of well, renewables plus nuclear and times when we have a deficit. So we depend on being able to balance out that surplus or deficit as part of a bigger system. And GB depends on being part of a bigger European system and that, albeit the capacity at the moment is, is relatively limited. So uh, that uh, balancing possibility in time and space is, is really important to be able to maximise the efficient utilisation, cost-effective utilisation of the resources that are there. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the stability of an electricity system in the future, then that remains a, a critical part. And this is where 
there is some you know, debate to be had about the cost-effective way of doing that. Flexible demand has a big part to play in it. Um, more interconnection capacity with the, you know, the wider continent of Europe has a big part to play in that. Pumped storage, other forms of storage, actually, energy storage, and we come back to the bigger en whole energy system picture, has a big part to play in that. You know, we, in a way, we, haven't, we ain't seen nothing yet by the time we try to decarbonise heat. This is why it is getting so much attention now. But it also offers some opportunities if we can store uh, heat or the energy that is used for heat. You know, it's, it's pretty low-grade energy. We're not doing an awful lot with it. So if that heat demand can be dealt with, then the kind of cleverer stuff we do with electrical energy, we can uh, do that. So... And just to return briefly to a point that Mark was making earlier about you know, the, the comparison, for example, between district heating and uh, uh, condensing boilers. The energy efficiency should be better when you do things at a bigger scale, but the cost effectiveness of delivering a certain amount of end product, which in this case is heat, may be different because of the sunk cost of the infrastructure or the need to build up a certain infrastructure. And that's where it becomes a tricky judgment to make in respect to the electricity system as much as anything else. Uh, so, some amount of schedulable generation, let's put it that way, uh, still seems to be very important, at least on a GB basis. And actually, there were good arguments for saying schedulable generation within Scotland is important in terms of, uh, for example, dealing with extreme weather events and the possibility of needing to black start the system. Now, schedulable could include hydro, can include interconnectors using the right kind of technology. Um, it could include another kind of nuclear plant, albeit with much less degree of flexibility. It might include CCS. Uh, Black Start could be achieved if you happen to wanted to do it on a windy day and you make use of that. So it just get, I suppose the basic point is it gets a little bit more complex to think about what the, um, the right investment strategy is and the right mix of technologies is. <coughs> Would anyone else like to come in on that? Uh, I think I, Gina Hanrahan. Well, well I, I think Keith. Keith. Yeah, <laughs> make me. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think um, the, so. The current power system uh, relies on 35% nuclear generation in Scotland, and that's increased as other, you know, the coal, coal plants have closed. closed. So, I, I, I think the assumptions are that those will. Uh, I'm not sure what the retirement uh, lifetimes are of, of those, but I think we're re relying on those for most of that uh, period in the climate change plan, um, and nuclear plants have been given lifetime extensions. So there's a there's a there's uh, you know maybe a, a rather hidden kind of reliance on. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I can't remember when Tor S is supposed to. Go. Twenty thirty. Twenty thirty. Yeah. I'm just thinking we'd have gone before that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I, I suspect the assumptions are for continued operation of, of both plants out to 2030 and the lifetime of the climate change plan. Um, yeah. My understanding is that the CCC scenario for the power sector for Scotland, which was produced in its March report, um, I, I presume assumed nuclear phase out by the early 2030s, by 2030, and showed that Scotland could remain a net exporter over the course of the year. Um, we, as WWF, unsurprisingly, don't support um, the need for continued or new nuclear beyond that point. We have an evidence base that shows that uh, Scotland can play to its renewable resource strengths as part of a GB grid. Integration is critical, um, and grid reinforcement to deliver that is, is absolutely part of the picture, along with demand reduction, flexibility and storage. There are a, a plethora of different... Um, interventions that we can make to ensure that we deliver security of supply and it shouldn't always be generation first uh, as, as the, the principle uh, that we operate on, particularly given what's happening around Hinkley, the price that's been awarded to it. it you know, we, we sh certainly should not be banking on uh, delivering new nuclear for Scotland or life extending forever. We don't need to. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think if there are no further questions from committee members, that's the conclusion of this session. Thank you very much to all of our witnesses for coming today, and I'll now suspend this sitting and we'll move into private session. Thank you very much.